to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Dr. Paul Saladino, my man. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me, <laughs> it brother. It is good, man. Yeah, we had a good morning, got a workout in. It's been a great morning. I tried to get you some lunch. You know, I figured <laughs> some grass-fed barbecue from Valentina's. It's the best barbecue that we have here with the best source meats, but they covered that shit in pepper, and you're like, fuck this. I just threw it on the floor. <laughs> I just threw it on the ground, man. Like, take your grass-fed brisket. <laughs> Covered in pepper and send it back. Just send it back. No, it's more for everybody else. It's an interesting point. We could we could start talking about this. So well, you're. I mean, for people who don't know, and I'm sure I explained this in the intro a bit, but you're really gone deep studying nutrition and diet, and particularly what where that's led you is to the carnivore diet for the most part, with a few modifications, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean. The human experience is fascinating. And I think that my whole life I've been interested in nutrition and kind of this idea that we get to drive this human body through life. And we get to determine based on the food we eat, whether it's a Honda Civic or a Porsche. And there's not, it's like you can absolutely define the quality of your experience in life in so many ways, mentally, physically, emotionally, with food. Of course, there's all these other pieces there, right? Mental mastery is separate. You know all about this. but like food, molecules in food, chemicals in food affect us at every level of our body. You know, they affect our mood stability. They affect our libido. They affect our body composition. They affect our emotional resilience. They affect our mental clarity. They affect our longevity. They affect how strong we are, how much we can do the things we like to do. So it's like, you get to decide, is it a Civic or is it a Porsche? Well, obviously I want it to be a Porsche, right? Or take your pick, Lamborghini, Ferrari, souped up Tesla, whatever you want. Those new Porsche Taycons are pretty, pretty sick. sick dude. The, uh, that's the, that is ultimately the point. Because first of all, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. So people, even if they wanted to be that Porsche Taycan or that new you know, Lamborghini or whatever, whatever their ideal body would be, maybe it's a fucking Hummer, who knows, whatever. Whatever you are, it's all good. But if you wanted to be that ideal of what your potential is, you may not even know what to do. Step one, you got to know what to do. And that's a big part of what you're doing. But then you really have to decide what's it worth to you? Like really what it's worth to you. But let's let's first focus because I definitely want to get there because that's a super important topic because most of us aren't doing a fraction of what we know at least, at least we think we know we should be doing. But, you know, first of all, let's clarify for people what, you know, some ideas about what they should be doing as far as nutrition is concerned. Yeah, so this is what's interesting. And you raise a really good point, and I just want to emphasize that if you listen to mainstream Western medicine, they won't even tell you. So just to accept that you can modify your life experience with diet massively, fundamentally, is pretty earth-shaking. That is earth-shattering in Western medicine. Outside of that, in the athletic world, people kind of get it, like CrossFitters, super high you know, uh, elite athletes, even casual athletes real realize what I eat affects how I perform. Input equals output. Input equals output. But if you get a chronic disease or if you get sick with anything, autoimmunity, depression, anxiety, bipolar, even psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, like eczema, psoriasis, all this autoimmune spectrum, Western medicine will not tell you that is responsive to diet. Even when it's something as blatant as inflammatory bowel disease, right? A lot of physicians, a lot of gastroenterologists or pick the physician that's treating you for your, for your illness will not tell you this is responsive to diet. So that's what's really important for people to know. Like, it's because GlaxoSmithKline doesn't have a right, fucking grocery store. Right, right, <laughs> right. And doesn't make anything, right? And doctors don't stay employed. Well, I don't want to say that because every, every single doctor I've ever met, and this is without exception, is intelligent and well-intentioned, right? But the system is built on getting people back in. And so what I have, I've never heard a physician say to me, I'm going to keep my patients sick so that I have a job. But what I have heard from people who have worked in healthcare 
maintenance and healthcare policy and healthcare management at hospitals is it's better for this hospital if there are more patients coming in for treatment, right? I've never heard a physician say that, but I've heard, known people who worked in hospital in the management. Business of medicine, right, yeah. in the business of medicine, that has been said. And that was just, to me, that was just really jaw dropping. Like, really? So that may be the place to focus. It's not physicians, right? And I really want people to know that it, that GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer, like in my experience as a physician and previously as a physician assistant in cardiology, there's really not insurance companies or pharmaceutical companies that I've ever seen paying doctors to like hand out meds to their patients. Like that's really, maybe it happens occasionally. I've never seen it, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the norm. Doctors for the most part are well-intentioned, intelligent people who want to help their patients. We're just not taught. Well, they're also doctors follow the clinical research. Exactly. And the clinical research is being paid for by for-profit pharmaceuticals. Yes. So all the whole host of clinical research is not on diet and nutrition because nobody can monetize that. So it costs millions and millions of dollars to do a phase three trial. And unless you have a patent on a pill that you can sell and make a return on investment on that, who's going who's gonna to support that? It'd have to be a conglomerate of different well-intentioned people trying to study this. And that's just happening way too infrequently to have enough science for doctors to really pay attention to. And without the science, I think doctors feel as though their hands are tied. Right. We are, as physicians, we are evidence limited. We are trying to be evidence-based, but we have become evidence-limited. If there is not a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial to prove that one diet is better than another, or one vegetable is doing this, or one or meat is doing this or that, physicians will say it doesn't matter. Like for instance, if there's no randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial to show that dietary intervention affects ulcerative colitis, your gastroenterologist or anyone's gastroenterologist is gonna tell you there's no evidence diet has an effect here. In the face of an overwhelming number of anecdotes which are convincing and should be studied. So you're right. right. It's we've just become too evidence limited in our mm. in our thinking and people discount anecdote and I agree. We can't base theory, we can't base large medical decisions on anecdotes, but when there is a mountain of anecdotes, when n equals 1 becomes n equals many, we need to find a way to study this in a way that will get through to mainstream western medicine. And these studies are starting to happen, which is what's so cool. And I'm happy to talk to you about some, about some of them that we've got in the works, but they're starting, but they're all crowdfunded. So I've got it. It's the only way. Right. I mean, I mean, the government's happy to drop a couple trillion dollars to lock down the country. It would be probably save a lot more lives if they dropped a couple trillion to study nutrition and feed the world. I don't know, just throwing ideas out yeah, there. Yeah. I don't make policy. I don't know shit. But just saying, like, if we could spend a little bit of that money and diversify it, because obviously we have these resources, like really study these basic building blocks of human life. Let's study pranayama. Let's study the utilization of breath. Let's study the utilization of cold and hot. Let's study nutrition. Let's study exercise. Let's study sex. Let's study all of these things that we can do. More studies of psychedelics. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, right now we are trying to do a crowdfunder <clears throat> for a carnivore diet study, you know, and it's like the goal is 200,000 is the base level and we'd love to get a million. But that's like a fraction of the cost of like most studies that are done sure. with, with pharmaceuticals got another friend, Dave Feldman, in the lipid space. They're about they're raising about $200,000 to look at the lipid hypothesis, the idea that high LDL, and we can go down this rabbit hole if you want, the idea that high LDL that's getting to be high from dietary interventions like a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet in the absence of metabolic dysfunction like diabetes, the, the hypothesis that that may not actually cause atherosclerosis. I don't believe it does. Mm. And they're going to test that by doing CT coronary angiograms on people who are ketogenic and carnivore with massively high quote unquote LDLs, low density lipoprotein, which is the colloquial bad cholesterol, and proving that, hey, you can have a very high LDL and no radiologic evidence of atherosclerosis when 98% of physicians would say, wow, with that LDL, you should absolutely accumulate atherosclerosis. There are two different physiologies here with LDL. It's just the, the tip of the iceberg to say that we need so many studies in nutrition. They're so cheap compared to what we've done with drugs. And hopefully we can start tipping the tipping the scales and getting people interested, but it would change the face of medicine when we do these. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's I mean, that's what you need. That's the that's the ammunition, that's the fodder. That's yes. everything that all of the doctors need. Everybody's complaining, oh, the doctors, the doctors. Well, 
we need to arm the doctors. What are they going to do? Fund their own studies? You know, like doctors are trained to follow the science as they should be. You know, and I I think there could be a a space to say doctors could be a little bit more open-minded and look a little bit more holistically. And that is a personal sovereign choice that every doctor could make. You're a fucking doctor. You did it. So like it is possible. But nonetheless, like the way that the medical system is designed is to study on science. So we got to just support things like these crowdfunding exercises to really show enough evidence and then put the evidence put the evidence forward that's what the psychedelic movement did you know it it wasn't based on anecdotes of a lot of people saying yeah i did mushrooms that changed my life it was the clinical trials that john john hopkins did it was nyu yeah yeah, and then all of these things started to be like okay well now this is becoming incontrovertible yeah and people who are trying to say something just like here's a study you don't even have to you don't even have to argue anymore just like here you go right you know it'll it'll be amazing and so hopefully in the next few years we'll get that but you know going back to your original question which is <clears throat> say we decide to be a Porsche of our choosing, or maybe we want to be a monster truck. You know, like, how do we do that? That's been the fascinating question for me. Uh-huh. This is the riddle, right? And that's what I've just been thinking about for many, many years. I was a physician assistant in cardiology. Uh, after I took some time off after college, I had this gallivanting period where I just skied and hiked the Pacific Crest Trail and climbed mountains. And I thought, I want to go back to school. So I went to PA school, was working as a cardiology PA and immediately realized I hate this paradigm. We're treating symptoms with medications. We're just covering symptoms. It's pharmaceutical based and symptom focused. What are we doing here? I, I want to go back to medical school, become an MD, and then try and create something different within the system from the inside. I knew that I had to be sort of an insider. I had to be a double agent. Right. And I snuck through somehow. They they let me in. <laughs> <laughs> I think that if they'd known what I was going to do, they yeah. may not have let me in. Uh, but I got through and I did residency at the University of Washington. But throughout all of it, I've been th- trying to really iterate in my own life because I've had autoimmune issues, which are resolved now, eczema and in connection, asthma throughout my whole life. At times, my eczema was so severe doing jujitsu that I had it all over my elbows and knees and lower back. I used to call it my eczema tattoo, my tramp stamp. It was horrible. And I would get this like weeping eczema right at my belt line and my back. And so throughout all of that, I've been trying to understand, okay, I'm not driving a Porsche. There's something off about my diet. And it's, it's made evident in this autoimmune syndrome that I have. I believe that this autoimmunity is connected with my diet. How can I modify my diet to improve this? And I've done basically everything. Uh, I did a vegan diet. So I was seven months of raw vegan about 12 or 13 years ago. Mm. I lost 25 pounds of muscle. So, uh, you know, people that are watching this on video can see that I'm like 170 pounds. I'm five, nine and a half. And the half matter, the half inch matters, you guys. <laughs> I'm say my, I used to be 5'10", but somehow I think I, I think I broke a vertebrae in my neck doing jujitsu and I've lost that half inch. <laughs> but Uh, You know, I was 140 to 145 pounds as a raw vegan, not healthy, horrible gas. You couldn't even be in a room with me. If we were doing this podcast right now, you'd be like, okay, I I, I don't want to wear a mask, but Mm. I need a mask. Like you don't want to be around me because I had such bad gas. And so then I was like, all right, I got paleo. I went to paleo, still had eczema. And then just started really iterating from paleo in my own journey and thinking, what do I need to cut out? Because the paleolithic diet, I think, is exactly the right idea. It's asking the questions, how did our ancestors eat? Should we mirror that? There are millions of years of evolution programming what our genetics are expecting from our environment in terms of food. And we've forgotten that. We so forget that in 2020, the way the world looks is vastly different than it was 10 generations ago. Mm. You know, 100 years ago, our world looked different. 200 years ago or 300 years ago, the world looked completely different. And we're talking about 3.5 million years of human evolution, of hominid evolution from, you know, when we transitioned from Australopithecus to Homo habilis and Homo erectus, which are really the first species considered to be hominid. So we're, we're a blink of an eye is what we are seeing represented today, but we have this amnesia. We think this is the way it's always been. This is what we've always done. You know, these years I've been on the, on the earth, humans have always shopped at grocery stores. No, 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 no. Humans have always eaten this type of food or used this type of oil. And we can get into all of that today, but It's really not. The way we're living today is this vastly evolutionarily inconsistent representation of what humans are used to. Mm. And and so many people are starting to say this in different ways. You know, Chris Ryan's recent book, Civilized to Death, I think is a great example of this. Just so many things about what we're doing today are civilizing us to death. And I think that food is no exception. And so we've just really need to start asking the questions like a paleolithic diet does. How did our ancestors do it? So a paleo diet says beans, 
and grains and dairy don't make sense evolutionarily. And I completely agree. Beans and grains are seeds and our ancestors didn't really eat these a whole lot. And they didn't really milk a whole lot of buffalo as they were chasing them down, you know, or we didn't yeah. really get a lot of milk or dairy. There are pastoral cultures today like the Maasai, but they're the exception. And it's hard to know what that culture was doing 500 years ago. The majority of cultures a thousand, a hundred thousand years ago were not milking animals. So these paleolithic ideas seem to be reasonable. A lot of people find vast improvements just by cutting out grains like gluten, containing grains, wheat, things like this, and then beans, which cause in, inordinate amounts of yep. gastrointestinal problems for humans, and we can talk about why, and dairy. But for me, that wasn't enough. It seemed to improve it, but I still had bad eczema. And then, okay, then I have to go further down the rabbit hole and think, what else is left? What else is bad for me? Well, then there's an iteration, which is autoimmune paleo. That, that cuts out seeds and nuts. Okay, those might be triggering too. And then it cuts out oh, things man, like- Oh man, you're coming for my nuts, I'm coming you? for your nuts, bro. Damn it. And your seeds. <sighs> Cashews too, bro? Cashews too, bro. We'll, Cashews we'll, too, We'll talk bro? about it. Damn. And then Paul. also it cuts out nightshades, right? And nightshades are these capsicum. Sounds like poison. Yeah. Well, these, they're <laughs> solanaceae. Nightshades is the solanaceae genus, which includes a lot of things that we like. Tomatoes that like barbecue sauce, mm. hot peppers, potatoes. These are from a genus of plant, solanaceae, that has solanine and other toxins. And a lot of people seem to react to this immunologically. It's a very recent addition to the human diet evolutionarily. Mm -hmm. So again, okay, you cut those out and I still had eczema. All right, what the heck is left? Well, then I learned about oxalates and it's like, well, what is high in oxalates? Well, beets, almonds, I'd already kind of cut those out. Spinach is high in oxalates. All right, let me cut out oxalates. And then still had eczema. And then you're like, what's left? Histamine? All right, what are the high histamine foods? Cut those out. What's left? Salicylates. And it just, it's Wait, really- what's, what's, what is, so talk about histamines and salicylates because I'm following you so far. Yeah. What else are we cutting here? We got tons. We got saponins. Okay, yeah, but talk about which, which thing the, each uh, of these different things are. Yeah, salicylates are in a lot of foods. They're in avocado. <sighs> yeah, but not, everybody's, wow. not everybody is sensitive <laughs> to all of these different things, right? These are all plant chemicals. Right. Not everybody's sensitive to all of them, okay. right? But they're in avocado, they're in- um, what else is salicylates? And they're in some berries, they're in almonds, there's things like this. There's a list in my book, I link to a list of high salicylate foods. And then you've got things like saponins, which are again, kind of in, in grains and nuts and seeds. They're kind of these soapy compounds, these, mm. these um, detergent-like compounds, which can be problematic. But then you go further down the rabbit hole and there's more things. What about lectins? Oh shit, lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. People may have heard about this with the plant paradox, although Stephen Gundry and I differ greatly in how we think about animal foods and that kind of thing. But he did a great job in popularizing the notion that, hey, there are high lectin foods out there that may also be triggering you. Most of the high lectin foods are things I'd already cut out. Things like grains and beans and seeds are high lectin, but there's lectins in milk. There's lectins in peanuts. There's lectins in tomatoes. So there's lectins in all kinds of plants that can be problematic. Mm -hmm. And then you just keep going and, then, and you realize, whoa, there is a veritable panoply of plant toxins. And you think, oh, wait a minute. Plants don't want to get eaten. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> like, I get it. They're just so highly defended. So earlier today, you were showing me a video with you with nunchucks, right? Right. Well, this is, this is like plants. Plants are just like nunchucks, psai, like samurai swords. They're just throwing. better. They're better than me, actually. <laughs> they're they're, 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 they're doing it for reals. Yeah. I had some foam nunchucks and I had Napoleon Dynamite in my head. <laughs> so it wasn't that for reals, but. But you, it's the idea that like plants have myriad weapons that we yeah. never think about. And so many of the plants that we eat today are not really plants that indigenous people eat or they're types of plants that have been rendered less toxic, but not entirely non-toxic by hybridization. This is things like potatoes. An ancestral potato would have killed us quickly. This is what happened, they think, to Chris McCandless, the guy from Into the Wild by John Krakauer. He was hanging out at that bus in Alaska and he ate like a wild potato or some kind of wild root and just died. He got so nauseous, he died. So ancestral plants are even less palatable, less sweet, smaller in the case of roots, and many of them are frankly toxic. Almonds, for instance, they have cyanogenic glycosides in them from many generations ago. We decided, hey, we want to eat that, so we're going to breed this poison out of them. But the intention of plants is very clear here. And it's the same with all the stone fruits. You ever crack open a peach pit? And it's like, hey, that looks like a little almond no, inside. But yeah. Yeah, the next time you're eating like a stone fruit, like an apricot or a peach, there's like, a, there's like that, pit, that pit inside and you can actually open the pit. There's a shell and you'll see the seed. And the seed looks like a little almond. 
And that's, that's an ancestral relative of it. But that seed inside the peach pit is very toxic. You could really hurt yourself eating lots of those because of these cyanogenic glycosides. They have cyanide-like compounds in these seeds. There's arsenic in seeds. So basically the idea is plants just are like, get away from me. Like you just- Sure, they want to survive. Exactly. They're stuck in the ground. Animals can run away, but plants are stuck in the ground. So they've said, hmm, I'm going to develop some chemical jujitsu here. Some of them get spikes like roses or cacti. Most of them just have these chemicals. And humans evolutionarily probably were not favoring plants. We don't have a lot of great detoxification mechanisms, easy to overwhelm. And some people get very sensitive to certain plant toxins based on their genetics. So this is my long-winded sort of lead in to, that's kind of been my thought process personally and professionally as I've written the book, this book, The Carnivore Code about how should we think about what humans might be eating to optimize, to make the civic into a porch. And we can go down whatever rabbit hole you'd like from here. I have a feeling that's a combination of excitement and depression. <laughs> Just <laughs> listening to you, thinking about all the foods that I may have to give up to really optimize because I've struggled. I've struggled with my gut. You know, I've struggled with my own, really the way I feel it. And there's a lot of science linking inflammation to depression. Absolutely. And so I can feel it. I can feel the physical, I can feel the physiology of depression when I have, when I vary too far from a keto-ish diet or like a really simple and carnivore-ish diet. I haven't ever committed like super strict, but I have like kind of like the safe foods and I'll kind of vary off those a little right. bit. But if I vary too far, I will. I know what it feels like. It's right. not like a thought that I'm depressed about. It's not the narrative depression, which is a different thing, which is probably some way that we're processing some grief about an expectation we had or about a hope that we had that is lost or whatever no this is like physical just a physical thing that i feel so and i've really been focused on that because everything in my life is like clearing up so now this has become kind of the primary thing that i'm tinkering with and i can absolutely notice it and i think i've been really looking forward to this podcast because i want to really understand all of these different categories and then also as my own experiment, just decide like, all right, well, how is my body handling these different things? And I've already had to let go of a lot of things that I was not happy to let go of. Like cheese doesn't feel good for me. And I love cheese and it's keto friendly. And I thought I was, <laughs> I thought I was good. And, and I just don't feel good when I have cheese. And there's probably a good reason for it, right? There's a lot of proteins in cheese, specifically casein yeah. and whey that are probably immunogenic. So you touched on a few things that I really want to highlight for people that are super important, which are that a lot, a lot of psychiatric illness is neuroinflammatory. And definitely we all go through psychic struggles. We have tragedy, we have trauma. And that, I'm not denying that, that people can go through difficult things or have sort of paradigms or thought schema that do not serve them. But a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of psychiatric illness is neuroinflammatory. Mm -hmm. And people will know this because lots of people have experienced that <clears throat> they get sick with a flu or something and they kind of feel a little depressed. You kind of just feel a little, a little bummed out. And it could be because you feel like, like junk, but you have inflammation in your body when you are sick with an inflammatory illness, like a viral illness, then it kind of clears up. And people will also know this, if you've ever, I'm sure you've done this, you know, you've had times in your life where you didn't sleep well. well what is going on there? Your immune system is just going haywire, your physiology's off, and you feel depressed, or at least I've experienced this. I imagine yep. you have as well. Sleep deprivation leads to this sort of physiologic change in our brain chemistry. And so it's not a far cry, and the literature does support this, that depression, anxiety, our neuroinflammation. We can measure this in the brain. We can look at these brain-derived macrophages called microglial cells and see them getting turned on. The immune system is getting turned on in depression. And we can look at levels of cytokines, which are these molecules the immune system uses to signal throughout the body in suicide attempters and suicide completers, and they're elevated. They're elevated. So we have people who attempt suicide or complete suicide, and you can look at levels of cytokines in their cerebrospinal fluid, in the fluid around the spinal cord and the brain, these inflammatory cytokines, specifically interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, are elevated. And then you can correlate levels of inflammatory cytokines with severity of depression. 
you can say the more depressed people are, the more these cytokines are elevated in their CSF and in their brain. So you're absolutely right that inflammation in our body can be transmitted across the blood-brain barrier and affect your mental state. But again, this is one of those situations where if you go see a traditional psychiatrist, they may not tell you that food affects your mood. Yeah, and Real you know, important. all you got to do is anybody just go go on a nice long fast. Yeah. Um, just see how good your fucking brain feels. Yeah. You know, you, like you might have a little lull where you get a little tired, but as soon as you get over that, if you've been on a fast, like you come out of there feeling so good. You're clean. It like recalibrates you because your inflammation has dropped to virtually, your, at least your food-based inflammation has dropped to virtually nil because you're not putting anything that your body is attacking it's perfect you know so like you feel that once and then but then you think like oh well it's some other mystery about fa fasting maybe but maybe not maybe it's just that you're not putting a bunch of food that's causing an inflammatory response in your body in your system for long enough that you can actually clear it and then see how you fucking feel it's a it's probably both things you know i think that the autophagy and the ketones are things that a lot of people find benefit with but understanding signal to noise in your experience of life is critical for every human. Mm -hmm. Most of us, before we start thinking about food, never know how good we could feel. We never know what it's like not to be anxious or depressed or a little bit frustrated, a little bit sleep deprived, or a little bit kind of fatigued or not have the libido we want because we've never been there. Yeah. We think we'd never know. You don't know what it's like to drive. You think of a Civic is all you got when you, and then you drive a Porsche, you fast and you're like, holy moly, that accelerator goes, man. And what's crazy and what's super interesting is understanding, because fasting is not sustainable indefinitely. No. <laughs> <laughs> understanding how to keep eating and keep driving the Porsche. And that's what we're all about. Or maybe not even needing to fast. I mean, as you exactly. said, like, like this ketogen, the nutritional ketogenic state is also awesome to sure. be in. When you're, when you're producing those ketones at a high level, you do feel great from that. But fasting is a different thing too. Yeah. You know, like there, you just start to track these different sensations that you start to feel. And but you might be able to get the majority of that without actually having to go through that fast. I mean, I still recommend it. It's good for longevity. It's good for a variety of things, and it's good for an experience as a human being to understand what that feels like. It's like you don't want to ever experience that. Like you should at least know what that feels like. Right. Like you're gonna go through your whole life and never know what it feels like to be fasted. Yeah. I don't know. That's weird to me. Your ancestors definitely did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On accident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When they couldn't get a kill. Absolutely. Yeah. So. You know, you you brought up something earlier, which we should talk about too. And I talk about this in the beginning of the book. We all have different relationships with food. And the very beginning of this conversation is, what's it worth to you? What is your quality of life equation? I talk about this frequently on my podcast and in other spaces and just say, my goal with doing this work is not to convince everybody to stop eating plants for the rest of their life. My goal is not to do, not to really tell anybody how to do anything. It's just to offer a tool that people might use if they're not thriving. But ultimately, like it's not my right or responsibility to tell anyone what their highest quality of life is. You get to define that, mm -hmm. right? And so once you define that, once you find your why, why would I want to make this dietary change? Because listen, a lot of ver food variety is, is delicious. Cheese is delicious. I can't deny that, right? Yes. Birthday cake is delicious. Snickers Questionable. Bar <laughs> <laughs> Snickers bars feel good on my, in my mouth, right? Like, uh -huh. like they feel good <laughs> on my- pleasure. Mouth, mouth pleasure. Mouth pleasure, high. They feel good on my tongue. Like, as we're saying, a lot of people, if they fasted and they understand their baseline, will realize that a lot of these foods make them feel like garbage afterward. But in the moment, there's a lot of drug-like foods that taste good that you are gonna have to, quote, give up. I don't think of a carnivore diet as a, as restrictive. I think of it as intentional. It's I get to eat. I am privileged enough to eat the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. My ancestors have celebrated these foods for thousands of generations. There is nothing more joy or celebration inducing in most indigenous cultures than a kill of an animal right? They have food for the whole tribe. They have a liver and bone marrow and bones and skin to make clothes or whatever they're doing with it. And they, they, they have enough food for days and days and days. And they have fat, they have fertility, they have rich foods. And we'll talk about why the organ meats are important. They have foods they know are going to help their women become fertile and their men become virile. And that is a celebration. And so, wait a minute, I am so lucky that in 2020, I can eat this every day. There's there's a lot of responsibility and ethics tied up in that too, which we can talk about. But like mm -hmm. humans have become the apex predator in a way that I can order from the farms that I appreciate 
and they'll hunt it for me. And, and I can eat, I can have with my tribe, my family, my community, the best foods on the planet. And we'll talk about why I think they are every single day of the war, of, of my life. Like how lucky yeah. am I? I'm not restricted. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm grateful because I'm making this intentional choice. But my why is always, I want to feel good. I want to look good. I want to perform good. And, and I believe in this work and I want to be able to do this work as well as I can. So for me, and this is, my brain might be wired a little differently. I've definitely had people tell me that I'm an alien. I'm probably a little OCPD, I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> like, but like, it doesn't, I, people ask me, are you ever gonna eat a cookie? Like, I promise you, Aubrey, I will never eat a cookie for the rest of my life. I just have no desire to. I don't have any intention to do it for the rest wow. of my life. I don't have any, I'll never need to eat a cookie. And it's not, I'm not, it's not out of discipline. It's just that for me, and this, I understand this is not as easy for other people. I just have chosen, like, that doesn't serve me. It just doesn't serve me in any way, shape, or form. So I want liver and bone marrow and what muscle meat. What if you've, like, forgotten what a cookie is like <laughs> five years from now? And you're like, what does a snickerdoodle taste like? I don't even remember. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I can't. You know, the last time I had a cookie was probably a decade, man. <laughs> like, I think at this well, point, I've already, model. I think I've already forgotten. And it, you know, we can talk about it because I am eating some sweet foods. I'm eating honey. That's a yeah. preview to what we'll talk well, about. Well, let's talk about the, let's talk about the core of it because some people are going to think like, this dude's not eating vegetables. He's going to fucking die. Right. He's eating red meat. Red meat is bad for you. He's going to have a heart attack. He's going to die. And so let's talk about that. Let's, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, because a lot of people are probably thinking that like, this is this is a recipe for disaster. Exactly. And that's what the mainstream tells you. And that's what most physicians will tell you. And so that's why I wrote the book. So in the carnivore code, you'll find the beginning of the carnivore code is an evolutionary story about our brains and how they got to be really big over the last 3 million years. And you can look at anthropologic evidence of the onset, the advent of hunting correlating with that. We talked a little bit about the plant toxins. We can revisit that. That's the second section of the book. The third section of the book is debunking all these myths about red meat and all of these myths that red meat is going to harm you in any way. So there's tons of chapters that go into more detail Let's about this. Debunk. Let's, Let's fucking debunk. Let's debunk. Let's debunk go. the shit out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so when you really think about this, most of what you are being told about this, most of what the listeners are hearing is based on epidemiology. So we have to understand what epidemiology is and how that's different than interventional research. We talked a little bit about the importance of research earlier in this podcast. Epidemiology, the vast majority of studies that you, the listener, hear about on the news, which is where most people get their information about health these days, or that your doctor is reading about nutrition, are epidemiology. You and I lamented early in this podcast how hard it is to do good nutrition studies. And it's so hard to do good nutrition studies that are interventional because who's going to benefit from the funding that most of what's been done over the last 100 years is epidemiology. This is observational research, which has a value, but we cannot overemphasize or conflate the value of epidemiology too far or conflate it with something different than it really is. Well, because everything's conflated, you know, like exactly. you're saying, like these people are eating meat. Well, they're also eating, you know, McDonald's as their primary source of meat and a bunch of candy, but they're eating a lot of meat. Exactly. You know, like there's so many fucking things in a lifestyle. If you're not controlling the variables, it's very little that you can get from it without really looking with a detective's eye. And you cannot make a causative inference. So you cannot say correlation is not causation. Most people have now heard that, but this is what it means. That these studies are giving people surveys. They're taking a hundred or a thousand or a hundred thousand people and giving them a survey that says, how much meat did you eat? Or how much, how much pork, how much chicken, how much steak, how many eggs, how many cigarettes, how much McDonald's, how much of all these things. They usually don't break it down with the, the junk food like that, but how many of these foods did you eat over the last 10 years? So it relies on a number of things. It relies on memory. People tend to underreport the amount of junk food they've eaten and overreport the amount of health food they've eaten because they want to please the interviewer and you're being asked. You know, nobody's going to say like, oh, I actually ate McDonald's six times a week for my whole life, right? Because that looks, everybody kind of knows when you have to write that on a survey, that looks horrible. Why, why would I make such a bad decision? They're embarrassed about that. And furthermore, exactly as you're saying, correlation is not causation. What do we know? Epidemiology tells us about the prevailing narrative in the culture in which these studies are done. And there's a very big difference in the research findings between epidemiology done in Asia and epidemiology done in the United States over the last 50 years. So let's just think about this. In the United States, what have we been told your entire life, my entire life, our parents' entire life about red meat? It's bad for you. Saturated heart attacks. Food, heart attacks. What should you eat? Vegetable oil, canola oil, margarine, <laughs> right? Like low fat, 
basically your whole life, except the last four or five years with this keto resurgence, most mainstream messaging has been that red meat is not good for you. So lean protein, lean white meat protein, mm -hmm. right? The le it's the leanest, lean the leanest protein, the leanest you no, can get. No saturated fat. Nope. So who eats red meat in that sort of a climate? People who are rebels, people who also smoke and drink and don't exercise and don't go in the sun, don't get prostate exams, don't get mammograms, are, are a lower socioeconomic status and ride motorcycles off cliffs, right? Like, But bro, if you take steroids and you eat chicken breast <laughs> and asparagus every meal, you will get jacked. You'll get jacked. <laughs> <laughs> that I know for sure. <laughs> you may get jacked. Because I've known some people who've done that. That is like the bodybuilding diet, right? It's so funny. Like bodybuilders will come up with some argument about this. Like they'll eat the same fucking thing over and over it'll be like tilapia and broccoli and this and they'll eat it every single day in cans of tuna and i'm like okay yeah 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 cool how do you feel terrible okay cool and then what are you are you on steroids like yeah like yeah okay sure what do your hormones look like For sure you'll get stronger <laughs> if you do that how big are your that's testicles that's not a testimony <laughs> yeah. to what a proper nutritional <laughs> right. fucking plan is right sir. right Muscles are not indicative of health, <laughs> you know, per se. Like we know that, and we know anyone that's been in the bodybuilding world or figure world knows that most people who do this will end up with complete hormonal catastrophe. Diverticulitis, some other fucking awful thing Horrible, will happen. horrible things, right? Yeah. And so this is not the answer, but who eats red meat over the last 70 years? People who are rebels. This is what we call unhealthy user bias, right? When you go to a, mm. if somebody goes to a barbecue and eats red meat, do they only ever eat just red meat? Hell no. They eat coleslaw. They eat a Coca-Cola with it. They're going to have some birthday cake. So this, like, and who doesn't eat red At least some meat, beer. Right? Some beer. But who doesn't eat red meat over the last 70 years? Who's a vegetarian? People who are health conscious because they're listening Doing to- Doing yoga. Yeah. They're getting sunlight. Playing tennis. They're fucking sunning their butthole. <laughs> they don't even know if that's good for them or not. Perineum sunning. <laughs> <laughs> they're getting it in there though. They're getting it in there. They get mammograms. They get prostate exams. They're more likely to be of a higher socioeconomic status because let's face it, vegetables are freaking expensive, right? Like you don't eat, nobody's going to spend money on fucking kale when you could get a Big Mac for $2. I'm going to spend $2 on a head of kale or $2 on a freaking Big Mac. Like done. Right, yep. nobody's spending money on kale if they don't have some income. Right, so this is the healthy user bias: the fact that vegetarians and vegans tend to have healthy activities. They do more exercise. Right, they do the unhealthy behaviors less. So epidemiology in the U.S. is confounded by this on both sides. You have people eating meat being unhealthy, people eating vegetables or shunning red meat being healthy. And so, what does the epidemiology look like sometimes? The people that eat less red meat are healthier. The people that eat more red meat are unhealthy. Problem solved. News headline, red meat shortens your life, except it's correlation. Mm. Now, one study or a number of studies that I discuss in the book that you will never hear about on the evening news were done in China or Asian countries. Over 200,000 people in both of these studies. And what did they find? They did the same sort of thing. How much meat do you eat? What are these other foods do you eat? They found that the men who ate the most red meat have the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease. And the women who eat the most red meat have the lowest incidence of cancer. So what are you telling me? Red meat is bad for Americans, but good for Asians? Were that genetically different? That's completely false. That is not true. That is not a defensible position scientifically. Mm. The narrative is different. What's the narrative around red meat in Asia? People who eat red meat are affluent. People who eat red meat are affluent. If you eat red meat, you are of the upper class in Asia. You're a baller. You're a baller. You're, you know, you're, you're crushing it if you're eating red meat. So not surprisingly, people that eat red meat do better. So what does epidemiology tell us? It tells us about the narrative in a country. It doesn't really tell us good or bad, plants, meat. We can't say anything about that. Right. But what it can do is help us generate a hypothesis. So we look at the hypothesis in the US. People that eat more red meat have worse health outcomes. We say, hmm, my hypothesis, my guess is red meat causes bad health outcomes. Let's make an interventional study where we take people and we replace, this study's actually been done, it's one of the references in my book, we're gonna replace 200 calories of carbohydrate in their diet with eight ounces of red meat a day. So they're, they're doing an interventional study. This is actually a study, okay? This is an experiment. And they're gonna follow them, I think it's a 10 week or a 12 week study. So they gave people eight ounces of red meat per day and they removed 200 grams of carbohydrates, okay? Or 200, I forget how many, something like that, 200 grams of carbohydrates, they're giving them eight ounces of red meat. What do they find? There was no increase in inflammatory markers and they trended down. So anyone that says that red meat is inflammatory, I would challenge them to show me a single interventional study that proves that in humans because they don't exist. And yet 
Plant-based advocates, the evening news is going to tell you right and left, red meat is inflammatory. And it's based on epidemiology. It's not based on interventional. And we have interventional studies to show that red meat and animal protein does not raise inflammatory markers. HSCRP, F2 isoprostane, TNF-alpha, these inflammatory cytokines. So in the face of this- And at the same time, even that study that you're citing, I guarantee that's some corn-fed beef. It probably is. That they gave him, right? They're not giving him grass-fed beef or some beef mixed with liver and kidney and everything. Like They're not actually going all the way to the extreme. This is just off the shelf an animal that's been eating a bunch of corn all the time and packing that corn into the muscle meat that they have. And so that's fine. It's fine. It's at least a good idea, but it's still not even the epitome of right. what is possible if we have the resources to be able to choose what we should eat. And people need to know that we don't really have studies beyond that. No government, no NIH, no one's ever funded a study to say, what if we actually give people healthy meat for six months? Let's give people a healthy meat-based diet and a healthy plant-based diet. So there's been no study, no interventional study on the carnivore diet? Not yet. Damn. Not yet. That's like a big miss. That's what we're raising funding for now. All right. So that's what we're doing, right? That's why you write the book is you say, look, we need interventional studies. What there have been is tens of thousands of anecdotes and there have been case reports, right? So there's never been a, there's many case reports that I reference in the book primarily from a group out of Hungary that are treating people with autoimmune disease and cancer with a carnivore diet. So there's published case reports, there's anecdote, there's thousands of people going, hey, I feel freaking good. There's your experience, Kyle's experience, Joe's experience, but we don't have an interventional controlled trial yet, which is what we're trying to do in the next few years to say, hey, let's take a pilot study, 20, 30 people, give them a carnivore diet and watch. Do their arteries blow up? Do their blood pressure go sky high? It's not going to, but let's prove it, right? Mm. So that's what's crazy. There's there's a study from 1930, which is pretty interesting because we've known about this for 90 years, with Willemar Stephenson, who was this Arctic explorer. He was an anthropologist from Harvard. He went to Alaska and he lived with the Inuit for many years. He wrote a number of books, Hunters of the Great White North, Not by Bread Alone. He sees them eating basically a completely animal-based diet. And he's like, this is crazy. But he says in the book, I grew to love it. He just felt healthier than he ever was in his whole life. You can read these accounts. And then when he came back to New York, he was just saying, I didn't get scurvy. What do you mean you didn't get scurvy? Of course you're going to get scurvy if you eat only animal foods. No, I didn't get scurvy. We don't believe you. We're going to study you. So they studied him and his friend for a month straight in Bellevue Hospital. They basically put them in a metabolic ward and locked them up. They observed them 24 hours a day. They ate nothing but a nose to tail organ meat containing carnivore diet. And the guys just were thriving. Their kidneys were fine. Their blood pressure was fine. People may say, we didn't know enough in 1930. Well, we didn't have the advances we have now, but they could check blood pressure and check kidney function. And the guys were great. And then the physicians continued to follow them for an entire year. Every day, they would come back to Bellevue Hospital and report for an entire year. So there's a published study about this. So they did an observation of two people by medical doctors in 1930 for an entire year on a nose to tail carnivore diet. And they said at the end, they were in just as good as health at the end, if not better than they were at the beginning with no evidence of any problems. So wait, scurvy is the, the narrative is that scurvy is caused by the lack of vitamin C. Right. And so are you saying that scurvy is not caused by lack of vitamin C or that there's vitamin C in the organ meat of the animals? And there's vitamin C in the organ meat and the muscle meat of animals. So All this, right. this is what's really cool. And whenever I so talk- So if those about, fucking pirates had beef jerky, they would have been fine. Well, here's the trick, right? <laughs> you can't make beef jerky out. It has to be fresh meat. Ah. It has to be fresh meat. So if the pirates are eating fish or, or hunting, right? Yeah. They'd probably be fine. But if you're sailing across the ocean, you're going to need something with some you know, heat-stable vitamin C in it or some, some aging-stable vitamin C. If they'd eaten raw meat, they probably would have been fine. They probably could have dry-aged their meat. Right. You know how they dry-age for like 21 days in the store and they'll just they'll, they'll shave off all the stuff? They probably would have been fine with that. But fresh meat contains plenty of vitamin C to prevent scurvy. So this is a really interesting thing. We should probably dig into this a little bit because people will say- because one of the I'm same, not going to get all my nutrients. Yeah, yeah. One of the statements that I make, which is very controversial, is that you and I and humans can get every single nutrient we need to thrive from animals without exception. And the reverse is not true. You cannot get every single nutrient you need to thrive from plants. And the third piece of that equation is that there are unique nutrients found in animal foods that are not found in plant foods. And we can dig into every single one of those those points. But the first one, you can get every single nutrient you need to thrive from animal foods. The, The wait a minute is vitamin C. There was an interesting set of studies in the 1930s and 40s of conscious objectors to the World War II. And they gave them scurvy. (laughs) We could never do this in 2020. Yeah, they gave them scurvy. What? Yeah, it's actually published literature. They gave them scurvy, conscious objectors to the war. 
And then they gave them varying amounts of vitamin C to see how much they needed to correct the scurvy. The lowest dose they gave was 10 milligrams, and it corrected the scurvy in the same clinical way that 70, 70 milligrams of vitamin C did, or even higher doses. So there was, they, this is like verbatim from the study, and I quoted in the book, there was no clinical difference between people receiving 10 and 70 plus milligrams of vitamin C in terms of outcomes for scurvy resolution. Same amount of time, same resolution. So we know that doses as low as 10 milligrams of vitamin C are enough to prevent scurvy in humans. 10 milligrams of vitamin C is the amount found in basically the barbecue that you had today for lunch. Maybe a little more than half a pound of grass-fed meat has 10 milligrams of vitamin C. If you're talking about liver, liver is about less than an ounce of liver would have 10 milligrams of vitamin C in it. Less than half an ounce of thymus would have 10 milligrams of vitamin C. Less than an ounce of brain would have 10 milligrams of vitamin C. Less than an ounce of kidney would have 10 milligrams mm -hmm. of vitamin C. You know, you see that like, if you're eating an animal nose to tail, it's pretty easy. I've tallied it up for myself. And of course, my diet is rich in organs and, and desiccated organ supplements. But I probably get 50 plus, 70 plus milligrams of vitamin C per day. I don't have scurvy, you know, and we can talk about the clinical signs of scurvy, nor do I have laboratory evidence of rampant oxidation. So the criticism I get from my colleagues sometimes when we're friendly debating is, okay, you can prevent scurvy, but vitamin C has other roles as an antioxidant. And how do you know you're not causing well, oxidation? Plus there's other antioxidants or exactly. similar anthocyanins, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's different roles, right, in the human body for vitamin C. We, it seems to regenerate glutathione at the level of the aqueous interface in the membrane and, and vitamin C or vitamin E. And so I've done the, the best studies we can do on myself and people I've worked with, and you don't see any evidence for oxidative stress. You can look at 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, which is a measure of DNA damage related to oxidative stress. You can look at things like lipid peroxides. You can do measures of oxidative stress, and you won't see them rise with a modest dose of vitamin C. So I have no problem with people supplementing with vitamin C, but at an academic level, I think it's an interesting point to defend and say, I really believe that with an entirely animal-based diet, you can get enough vitamin C for your body to be optimal from a, an, a redox, a reduction oxidation balance. And we can talk about that more. Mm -hmm. the, the one caveat I'll say about vitamin C supplementation is that I do have some concerns that mega doses of vitamin C may create, uh, may, may predispose some people toward kidney stones because excess vitamin C can be broken down into things like oxalate and things like that in the body. So we will excrete more of that and you can get calcium oxalate kidney stone incidence does seem to increase with megadosing vitamin C. What our ancestors really have ever gotten, 500 or 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, not unless they went ham on an orange tree or lemons, right? It's pretty rare. You think and about- that's not even a megadose. I mean, a megadose of vitamin C for right. someone who really wants to take it's, a megadose is 5,000 milligrams. Which is a somewhere. lot of vitamin right. C, a lot of vitamin C. So if you actually looked at that, if you gave someone 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C orally, they're probably gonna get diarrhea. Um, and we know it can affect B12 status negatively, which is another important B vitamin. And if you measure their urinary oxalates, I suspect you would see a bump and that's probably not a good thing. So do you even need that, right? It's a question for humans, but it's an interesting point. So that's the vitamin C story that everything I've seen hasn't convinced me that we need more. If people want to supplement with modest doses, I'm fine with it, but I don't think you need it ideologically from animals. And then beyond that, like you really look at what humans need to thrive in terms of vitamins and minerals and animals are the multivitamin animal foods are the multivitamin. We've all kind of been told this narrative, eat your greens by our moms, eat your broccoli, you know, mm -hmm. eat your broccoli, eat your pea soup. You need the vitamins in there. And you think, well, what, what vitamins am I getting from broccoli that's so magical that I can't get in animals? People say folate. No, there's tons of folate in animal, in animal liver and organs. Absolutely way more folate. I went on this TV show, The Doctors, and they totally ganged up on me and it was a travesty. But after the show, the producer comes to me and says like, well, there's no vitamin K in animal foods. And I thought, are, what are you talking about? Like, that's completely wrong. There's the, the, really the, the, the really the only place we can get a full spectrum of vitamin K2, which is the spectrum of menaquinones of varying chain, lamps, in, chain lengths, MK4 to MK11 and 13, is in animal foods. This producer, they clearly had no idea what they were talking about on the doctors. But if you look at things like liver on the USDA website, it'll tell you there's no vitamin K because they're only measuring vitamin K1, which is phyloquinone which is a different, which is sort of a plant-based type of mm. vitamin K. But what's super fascinating about the vitamin K story is if you look at epidemiology, right? I'll admit this is epidemiology, but it generates a hypothesis, which we can test, called the Rotterdam study, and multiple studies which show the same thing. Vitamin K1 intake is not correlated with any 
decreased incidence of heart disease. No matter how much vitamin K1 you eat from spinach all day long, no change in heart disease risk in this observational study in Rotterdam. And there's another one that's very similar. I talk about both of them in the book. Vitamin K2 intake, if you get more than 37 micrograms of vitamin K2 a day, that was the tertial that had the lowest incidence of both coronary heart disease and calcific aortic sclerosis when the aortic valve gets calcified. 37 micrograms of vitamin K2 was the upper tertial, meaning 37 micrograms of vitamin K2 is what you get in like less than half an ounce of liver. That was the best, that, they, they were, that, that caused a huge risk reduction. Even that amount of vitamin K2, huge risk reduction. What if they had gone further and said like, what if people get 50 micrograms or 100 micrograms of vitamin K2 a day, which is, I mean, with a, an animal-based nose-to-tail carnivore diet, you're getting over 200 micrograms of vitamin K2 a day. They didn't even study that. Who knows how low? You'll hear this now. People will take vitamin D with K2, which makes sense for most people who are not getting animal foods or rich sources of K2 in animal meats. But vitamin K2 is well known to be important for partitioning of calcium in our body. And the more vitamin K2 people get, preferably from real food, the lower our risk of coronary disease seems to be. But where do we get K2? It's almost entirely from animal foods. Right. But nobody will ever tell you that. All right. So all the, all the basic vitamins, you're making the argument, all the basic vitamins are covered, all the letters, all the things that we see. All in the it. letters, all the numbers. Right. And more bioavailable in animal foods too. So, okay, let's take something like sulforaphane. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is something that there's, you know, Rhonda Patrick's out there talking about the benefits of sulforaphane and broccoli sprouts. You freeze the broccoli sprouts, you mix it with some mustard seeds, right, right. maximize your Boom. sulforaphane, you're going to live forever. You're going to get a beautiful butt or shoulders <laughs> or whatever you want, you know, like you're going you're gonna to live forever and be handsome with sulforaphane. So this is completely different now. Now we're into the realm of plant compounds. These are sort of the magical, quote, phytonutrients. And mm -hmm. I, I take a strong stance against these. I don't believe, I think the narrative with these is completely wrong. We've gotten this all wrong. And I'll tell you why. And this is what really bends some minds, okay? So in the beginning of this podcast, we talked about plant chemicals and plant defense mechanisms. You ever seen that movie Goonies, like where Data's like booby traps, right? Yeah. <laughs> Slick shoes on the log with booby traps. I, I, I always think of this, like sulforaphane is a booby trap. And you know it's a booby trap if you look at the way it's sprung. So sulforaphane, you were exactly talking about it. Sulforaphane doesn't exist. Do you know how much sulforaphane is in broccoli seeds or sprouts? Very little. Zero. You have to fuck with it. Zero. You have to chew it, right? You have to chew it because it's not sulforaphane. It's a precursor to sulforaphane. It's a trap that's not sprung. And it's called glucoraphanin, which is a glucosinolate. There are many types of glucosinolates in plants. And we can talk about other glucosinolates, allyl, isothiocyanate, things like this. So glucoraphanin is a glucosinolate. It's the unsprung sulforaphane trap. Then you add mustard because of myrosinase. But in broccoli is myrosinase. And when the plant is chewed by an animal or Aubrey or Rhonda, hopefully it's more, more Rhonda doing the chewing than, <laughs> than Aubrey, right? Like when Rhonda chews the broccoli sprouts- I used to have bags of frozen <laughs> broccoli sprouts. So I did it. I'll I know. fucking put them in a blender. A lot of Let people Let the do. blender teeth do the work for me. Right. So when the blender do the tea thing, right? Do the, does the tea thing or Rhonda does the tea thing, that myrosinase in the broccoli seed or the broccoli sprout combines with glucoraphanin, boom, trap is sprung. Goes pshaw, and sulforaphane comes out. So sulforaphane- But why is it a trap? It's a trap because, what have we been told about sulforaphane? That it's an antioxidant, right? Correct. That is 100% wrong biochemically. No organic chemist in the world would debate that sulforaphane is a pro-oxidant. You cannot say sulforaphane is an antioxidant. It is a pro-oxidant, okay? So that is biochemically incorrect to say that so many of these plant molecules that we are told are antioxidants are and our antioxidants, they're pro-oxidants. So what does this mean? This gets into a little bit of esoterica, so bear with me. We're gonna, we're gonna go back to like mm -hmm. college chemistry here. Oxidation and reduction are the gain and loss of electrons. Loss of electrons, oxidation, gain of electrons, reduction. When I was in college, we used to say, Leo the lion says Gur to remember the sort of the acronym to help you remember those. So in order for something to be an antioxidant in the human body, it's going to donate an electron to a molecule that has another unpaired electron. And that's the free radical. That's, that's like essentially a, right? a free radical scavenger. Now, plant molecules do not do this in humans. We have molecules that do it in our own endogenous biochemistry, like glutathione. So glutathione is an absolute superhero. It's a three amino acid peptide that goes between oxidized and reduced states. And it has these sulfur groups that donate electrons to these irascible free radicals. You think about free radicals, oxidative stress is important in the human body. You and I did a workout earlier that creates oxidative stress. Oxidative stress triggers 
growth in humans, and we know that we use reactive oxygen species at the level of the mitochondria for important signaling processes, but too much oxidation is a problem. And so if oxidation gets out of hand, glutathione is there to be like, whoa, 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 just calm down, you know? Glutathione like walks around the riot, handing out Care Bears and giving hugs <laughs> and, you know, chilling people out. Maybe it's giving them, you know, whatever. It's giving them whatever's chilling them out, right? It's mm. playing some soothing music, putting on some headphones with Mozart. Chill out, bro. Chill yeah. out. You're good. Weighted blankets. Yeah, yeah. Weighted blankets. Just, Back rubs. Yeah, exactly. That's mm. foot rubs. Glutathione's just going around giving foot Lavender rubs. Lavender spray. Yep. To, to, <laughs> to, the, to the free radicals who are just kind of like all pissed off and like there's too many of us, right? A little bit of it is okay, but too much is too much. So plant molecules don't do that. Plant molecules do the reverse. Sulforaphane does the reverse. The reason that sulforaphane doesn't exist in broccoli sprouts, broccoli seeds, is that it's a pro-oxidant. If you look at the chemistry, sulforaphane wants to steal an electron. It wants to oxidize a molecule. It's a stealer. It's not a giver. Sulforaphane is a taker, not a giver, right? A taker is an oxidant. A giver is a reducing agent. So sulforaphane comes into our body, and this is where the misunderstanding has been. So I'll work through this. So forfane comes into the human body. It starts pulling electrons. Give me those electrons. Give me those electrons. It's going through and like razzing people up. You know, it's like it's putting piles of bricks at the at the freaking you know right. Antifa. It's, it's freaking throwing bricks through windows, <laughs> right? Like, and so so forfane is walking your body, throwing bricks through windows. It's it's pulling electrons from other molecules. It's oxidizing molecules. This has been demonstrated repeatedly. It oxidizes membranes. It turns on your antioxidant response mechanism. There are lots of molecules that do this. This is a really fascinating point that we should really drill down on. Yeah. I'll do my best to make it very clear. So most of this, or a lot of this oxidation reduction response, hormesis, happens around an enzymatic system or a signaling system in our genes called the NRF2 system. That's a transcription factor that's associated with a molecule called KEEP1. It's not important what it is, but when sulforaphane comes in and triggers more free radicals, triggers more oxidative stress, NRF2 dissociates from KEEP1, goes to the nucleus, and turns on genes involved in the antioxidant response for the human body. So sulforaphane indirectly upregulates our glutathione which is why it looks like an antioxidant. Does that make sense? Sure. This is the sort of colloquial misconstrual, if that's a word. This is the colloquial misinterpretation of what sulforaphane does. So people might say, okay, well, that's okay, right? That's why it's a hormetic. A little bit of a poison makes you stronger. Yes and no. And this is, I think, one of the most important points that I can get across with, about, with regard to plant molecules. It has been shown in studies that if you give people sulforaphane in the short term, you will see an increase in glutathione. Because sulforaphane is a pro-oxidant, it's going to increase your endogenous glutathione. So that they say that's good, right? You want more glutathione. But part of that glutathione is going to fight the sulforaphane to begin with, right? It, it is, and sulforaphane also has side effects in the human body that are always ignored. And this is the part that we forget about repeatedly. When People go to the pharmacy to get a medication. I don't prescribe medications much anymore because I do most of my practice with dietary change and lifestyle. When I was a PA, I would give somebody a prescription for metoprolol or a statin. I shudder to think that I actually gave prescriptions out for statins. But when someone goes to the pharmacy for this, they will get a package insert with all the side effects of Lipitor, a statin. You know, you might have memory loss. You might have- Statins you know, are complete bullshit, right? They're horrible, man. They're horrible. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about that too. You might get muscle aches. You might get, you, you know that any medication you get from the pharmacy has a list of side effects. It comes with what's called a package insert. Well, why do we think that plant molecules are any different? They have package inserts too. And a lot of the medications we use are derived from plants. Chemotherapy, paclitaxel, aspirin, digoxin, metformin is derived from a French lily. So- they all, plant molecules have side effects. The problem with plant molecules is that we have assumed them to be benevolent. We've been sold what I believe is a, is a false tale from the very beginning. We're looking at it incorrectly. We've got them all wrong. They're poisonous. And the, my real problem with sulforaphane is that while it's triggering your glutathione to go fight the antiox, the, the free radicals that it created, it's also circulating in your body and preventing the absorption of iodine at the level of your thyroid and messing with your DNA transcription in other ways. It has all these other collaterally damaging side effects that everyone is blind to, right? In the study with sulforaphane and glutathione, they're not checking people's thyroid. They're not looking at these effects. And so when you're eating compounds like this that are called goitrogens, if anyone doubts the, the truthfulness of this statement, just look at westernized, at like a developing Africa or anywhere in the world where people have these big necks. Have you seen these goiters? Sure. That is from iodine deficiency induced by goitrogenic foods that contain isothiocyanates just like sulforaphane. 
allyl isothiocyanate, goitrin. There's tons of these compounds that rob your thyroid of iodine. That's exactly why it happens. These people have low iodine diets because they're not eating animal foods and they're not eating fish, and they get these huge goiters because that molecule has all these side effects. But, you know, I really respect Rhonda Patrick's work, work, but she's not telling anyone about the side effects of sulforaphane. Right. So what you have here at this point is risk and benefit. And so my question is, how do you know which is which? And the, the premise or the, the, the position that I advance in the book is that the risks are not worth the benefit because the benefit is redundant in the first place. And this is something that's really cool to talk about. So this is, sulforaphane is the perfect example of what I would call molecular hormesis. You are, in, you are taking in a molecule that is acting as a toxin and your body is reacting to it, perhaps by increasing glutathione a little bit. This is a molecule. It's molecular hormesis. There's lots of these molecules that can do mm -hmm. this that we think can increase the amount of glutathione. They're molecules. Molecular hormesis molecules have side effects, whether it's curcumin or resveratrol. Right. You pick your molecule. I can find you literature that shows a side effect to it if it's a plant molecule. Now, these are never talked about. Environmental hormesis is where the concept of hormesis comes from. I mentioned that word earlier. I'll just make sure the listener knows. It means like a little bit of poison is good for you, makes you stronger. Or even cold therapy. Exactly. Is, is a hormetic stress. Environmental hormesis is what I've termed it. Exercise, cold therapy, heat, sunlight, ketosis in a way is environmental hormesis, starvation, fasting. Now, these are very different. In the case of ketosis, we generate beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, so there are molecules, but they're endogenous molecules. Right. We're not taking in a molecule. There's a difference between cold plunging, sauna, exercise, and sunlight. There's no molecule coming into my body, right? That's an environmental hormetic. That is where the concept of hormesis originally came from. But we have conflated molecular hormesis, which is synonymous with xenohormesis, with environmental hormesis and thought, aha, see, we can do the same thing. I can get the same benefits of exercise by chomping on broccoli sprouts, except you can't. And you don't even need to because if you're doing cool things, right? If you are swimming in cold water, if you are doing the sauna, if you are exercising, there's very good research to show you've already got enough glutathione, man. You've already got enough glutathione. Your glutathione stores are topped off. So forafane isn't gonna increase your glutathione anymore and then you're just gonna get shitty side effects. Mm. GI effects, harm to the gut, affecting the thyroid. Does it make sense? So, and there's really good studies. In the book, I talk about one with cold water swimmers in Berlin, kind of the original OG cold plungers. Yeah, they swim I, for I like, have that study in my book. Yeah, you do? Yep. Yeah, they swim for like an hour in the cold water in Berlin. And you can look at the glutathione levels. Their baseline glutathione levels are higher than controls. They go to swim for an hour, their glutathione level goes down because they just had some oxidative stress. My glutathione, your glutathione level are, are higher than the baseline average guy eating donuts. We exercise, it goes down a little bit. That oxidative stress has the exact same effect on my NRF2 system and your NRF2 system. We make more glutathione. There was no exogenous molecule. There was no xenohormetic that was needed. It was just living your life like your ancestors always have. So when you, these people go swimming in Berlin, they get oxidative stress. It triggers NRF2. They make more glutathione. Now, when you compare it head to head, you don't need, there's no really convincing evidence that sulforaphane, resveratrol, curcumin make you any better than you can be without them. And then you can avoid all the side effects. And the other tangential effects are typically positive from something that's an environmental or exactly. hormesis, right? Discipline. Like, yeah. There's a lot of other things. Community. That, mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, exactly. Hormones that get released and different things that happen when you immerse yourself in the cold, it's, it's different. Absolutely. You know, norepinephrine, adrenaline versus cortisol, all these different things, all these modulations start to take effect, which are net positive. Exactly. Usually, when you look at it, same with working out, same with all of these different things. All right. So you mentioned a couple of these and, and I really deeply appreciate you going down that sulforaphane rabbit hole, partly to talk about sulforaphane, but partly to demonstrate that you really know what the fuck you're talking about, <laughs> which if every, anybody who's listening, they're like, all right, well, he clearly knows enough that I'm going to take him seriously. And that is a value, my friend, <laughs> that is a value. So <clears throat> all the similar story, I imagine with resveratrol, curcumin, there's a similar story that you're going to tell that it is a molecular hormesis that we're talking about at, and it's causing something that somebody's looking at from a narrow myopic lens exactly. and saying, this is happening here, but they're ignoring the whole rest of it. So let's just assume that that's true because we don't have time to go down and let you debunk curcumin and all of these other things that we've been told are good. Resveratrol is pretty interesting. I'll just talk about it for 45 seconds okay. because everybody loves this one. It's different and unique. 
Resveratrol is this molecule from grape seeds and peanut seeds. And dark red wine. And it's, yeah, right. But, and it's in dark red wine because it's in the grape seeds when we, when we crush the grapes, right? It's, it's a defense chemical produced by those plants in response to a fungus called Botrytis fungus. Resveratrol isn't like, you know, a molecule that plants are like, here, humans, you know, here, have this molecule, right? <laughs> Maybe molecules like that exist. We could debate that with like- It's like, a, it's like we have a theory that plants are here to help us. Plants are our friends. Nah, son, plants are here to fuck you up. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> and so it makes this molecule resveratrol. And somebody found it. David Sinclair has been involved in this work. I had him on my podcast. We talked about this a little back and forth. Resveratrol is fascinating because what resveratrol does, resveratrol also activates NRF2, but it also activates sirtuins, which are these genes involved in NAD and NADH and this ratios, okay? And turning on sirtuins is associated with longevity. So people are like, oh, I'm going to take resveratrol and I'm going to get my longevity. I'm going to get free longevity. Except it doesn't really work that way because number one, you can induce sirtuins to go on just by living a radical life, which is sort of my cheesy catchphrase, right? But by fasting or being in ketosis, your NAD to NADH ratio changes, NADH2 ratio changes, and your, and your sirtuins come on. David Sinclair didn't even know this. He's not even familiar with ketosis. You can turn on your sirtuins by fasting or by doing a low carb diet. I don't think you have to do it all the time. I am in ketosis every morning and I eat carbohydrates twice a day because I do a time restricted feeding schedule. But anyway, you can turn on your sirtuins in exactly the same way, just by living like our ancestors did. You can get the benefits of these quote longevity genes. You can change your NAD to NADH2 ratios just by doing that. And what does resveratrol do on the back end? Well, it decreases androgen precursors because it acts like a xenoestrogen. Mm, that's not good for men or women. So androgen precursors are things like DHEA, which turns into testosterone, kind of important for both men and women to live mm -hmm. healthy lives. And it's been found in studies to worsen metabolic syndrome. It like worsens glycemic control. So what was so fascinating to me and mind blowing as I was writing this book was, oh man, I see this pattern over and over and over. And it was just looking at it through a different lens. Right. And of course I'm coming at it from like the perspective of, I don't think these plants want to get eaten. Is there a possibility they're bad for me? And so it looks different to me, right? It's all the perspective. Everybody else is coming at it from the perspective. These plants are good for us. And so you can really, you can look at it both ways, but I think that when you look at them together, the takeaway exactly as you're saying is, why the heck are we eating these plants if they're doing, giving us a redundant benefit with an, a net negative with all these sort of side effects? Let's assume that through this, you've convinced people of largely of your case and of course if you read the book the carnivore code i'm sure you go far deeper, deeper. <laughs> into, into all of these things let's say someone's like all right fuck it i believe you i believe you paul like i'm in man so let's talk very practical here let's talk about like the easiest way to get close and then what's the most like if you want to be stricter 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 right like so let's talk about like all right let's say someone just wants to get their feet wet with kind of exploring this like what are the most important things to cut out what should you focus on? And then let's get tighter and tighter to what you feel like would be the crown jewel if you have impeccable you know, discipline and desire to optimize your physical function. So let's take people on that spectrum. Full journey. So to frame it for people, like I said in the beginning, my goal is not to convince everyone to stop eating plants. My goal with the book and with the messaging is twofold. To exonerate red meat, we talked about that a little bit earlier, to, to really help people understand there's a different story here, that red meat is good for you and an integral part of the human diet, and number two, to help people understand that plants exist on a toxicity spectrum and can be harmful for some people who are uniquely sensitive. I think there are many people who can tolerate some plants more than others. And in the book, chapter 12 is the longest chapter in the book. And that is the chapter where I lay out how to do a carnivore diet. And in that book, I kind of decided to create five tiers of a carnivore or carnivore-ish diet. So I got that from Tate Fletcher. You know, he was talking mm -hmm. about hanging out and somebody said, oh, Tate's carnivore. And he said, carnivore-ish. And I thought, that's great, carnivore-ish. I like it. Mm -hmm. So tier one is a carnivore-ish diet. And the, I think that the easiest way for people to be carnivore-ish is to eat meat and animal foods, including organs, as the majority of their diet with some plant foods that I believe, this is just sort of my hypothesis, my, my construct are the least toxic. And so what are the least toxic plant foods? If you look at plants, most of that plant is saying, get away from me. Roots, stems, leaves, and seeds. And seeds includes seeds, grains, legumes, and nuts. Those are all seeds. We kind of talked about that earlier. So those are all seeds. I'm coming after mm -hmm. your nuts. Fucking cashews. I'm <laughs> thinking about them right now. It's so good. I know. They're but so delicious. They just don't want to get eaten, brother. <laughs> I'm telling you. Like, okay. So what's left? Fruit 
right? Fruit, not exclusively, but most of the time, the plant is like, all right, I'm going to take my seed, which I don't want you to eat, and I'm going to encapsulate it in this fruit. I kind of want you to eat this fruit. I'm not going to make the fruit super toxic for you. I'm going to make the fruit sweet. I'm going to make it colorful. Humans have color vision. And if you look at indigenous cultures throughout the world, as you get closer to the equator, they eat more plants, but they don't eat more vegetables. They don't eat more roots, stems, and leaves. They eat more fruit. So I recently did a podcast with Lauren Cordain and his crew. He wrote The Paleo Diet like 20 years ago. He's like the OG, one of the OGs with Rob Wolf in The Paleo Diet World. And they were talking to an anthropologist from Harvard named Douglas London, who went down to the Amazon and found this previously uncontacted tribe of Amazonians, which I think is so cool, called the Kaiwi Menno. And what do they eat? They eat animal foods and fruit. And you see this pattern over and over and over in indigenous cultures. They will eat fruit when it's in season, when they can get it, and they'll eat animals. So a tier one carnivore diet is like, it's meat and fruit. And in the book, I said, a lot of foods that you and I might not even think about as fruit are actually fruit, like an avocado, like a squash. I prefer winter squash rather than summer squash because you can get the seeds out uh, of, a, of, a, of a winter squash. You know, you can scoop the seeds out. Mm -hmm. a, a summer squash or like a cucumber, if you're eating the seeds, maybe that has more lectins for some people who are uniquely sensitive. Again, the book is written for people who are looking to optimize and people who have sort of recalcitrant autoimmune issues that are not getting better. If you're thriving and listening to this, dude, high five, don't change anything. Send me a DM. I want to be your friend. I want to learn from you, you know? like. Yeah. But this book is written for people who are not thriving, who want to get better. And most people have something they know can get better. So so I'm trying to give them tools and not just be super wishy-washy about these things and say, yeah, don't don't eat that. So the, the non-sweet fruits might be like a cucumber. You take the skin and the seeds out, avocado, berries. I mean, heck, you can eat an apple if you want, cherries, berries when they're in season. It's pretty darn doable for humans to do that. You know, I think when I tell people, I eat a carnivore diet. They're like, I can never do that. I'm like, what if you could eat berries and avocado and squash if you tolerate it and cucumber and, and maybe some- What about uh, coconut? Well, coconut's a nut. It's a seed. So it's, it's not- It's actually a nut. It's a nut, it's yeah. It's a giant nut. It's a giant nut. Hmm. So it's kind of, I think it's one of the less toxic nuts for people, but it's a giant nut. So <laughs> it's a giant nut. It's one of the ones you might- So, so a coconut makes a coconut tree? Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly how it happens. Yeah, you never seen that? Like you, you go to Hawaii, you'll see actually the, the sprouting thing come out of the coconut. Nope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's never actually that. how it works. All yeah. right, fair yeah. enough. We'll grow a coconut tree in your yard. <laughs> Please, I'll, I'll that'd be bring, amazing. I'll bring you some coconuts. Um, so probably the best part of a coconut is the water inside. Sure. Right. You, you may not want to drink. You may not want to eat the the pulp unless you can tolerate it. And anecdotally, when I was in medical school, I used to make my own coconut milk, and. I, I always felt a GI thing that was weird afterward. I would take coconut, shredded coconut, put it in warm water, put it in the blender, and then squeeze it like through the cheesecloth. And I was like, oh, it's so good. Coconut milk, I love it. And whenever I would chug that at night, my stomach was like, oh, it's my mm. anecdote. But if I would ferment it, it wasn't as bad. I could deal with fermented coconut. Mm -hmm. And what we see repeatedly in these indigenous cultures is that when they eat plants, when they eat nuts or grains or legumes, they're always fermenting them. This is essentially where sauerkraut came from. Like, we're gonna eat this plant, which we know is super toxic. We're gonna ferment the crap out of it and actually make it a little less toxic so that we can survive. But ultimately, it's probably a survival food for our ancestors. And if you look at fermentation, it does break down the glucosinolates. It breaks down those goitrogens in cabbage, which is another brassica vegetable like we talked about earlier. So interesting little aside with fermentation there. But carnivore-ish diet, tier one, meat, Organs, if you can do them. If not, do something like the desiccated organs and fruit and see how and you do that. And if you're going to go carnivore, if that's level one, then point five would be ferment everything that you can. So yeah. if you're going to have coconut milk, coconut yogurt, if you're going to have you know, some of these other vegetables, have sauerkraut or kimchi or exactly. some of these other things, allow the fermentation process. If you're going to have bread, have sourdough bread. Yes. If you're going to like, this is the kind of point five level of just finding the ways to actually make the stuff that you're eating as less toxic as possible. Exactly. And I think level 0.25 is get rid of vegetable oils. That's been a really huge thing for me recently. Yeah. I just want people to understand the oils. And if you're getting to level carnivore tier one, you're already getting rid of vegetable oils because you're not eating any of that stuff. But by vegetable oils, I'm talking about corn, canola, soy, peanut, safflower, sunflower. These are a metabolic nightmare for humans. And we can go down this rabbit hole if we have time today. But just suffice it to say that I think that this is going to be an oversimplification in broad strokes, but the majority of metabolic disease for humans today is caused by excess linoleic acid, which is this omega-6, this, 
this 18 carbon omega-6 fatty acid found in vegetable oils that is present at evolutionarily inconsistent levels in our diet in 2020. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier before we jumped on the podcast. I think you were out of the room. Like the amount of linoleic acid that we get in our diet is as mainstream Western humans, not you and I, is 15 to 20% of our calories. Maasai, Tokelau, whatever indigenous people you want to look at, Kadza, Ikung, San, 2%, 3% linoleic acid. And their three to six ratio is far better. Far, far better. Which and that's way less inflammatory. Way less inflammatory in, on so many different levels. So the reason, and it's actually, what's interesting is that when their linoleic acid gets to be so low, they don't necessarily always get tons of omega-3. The ratio looks way better because right. they're getting so much less omega-6. So that excess omega-6, I think if, if people need to do one thing, one thing, don't even think carnivore or anything, just cut out vegetable oils religiously from your diet and then send me a DM because you're gonna feel 10 times better. You don't have to do anything else. But remember, cutting out vegetable oils means no processed food, you know, no mayonnaise. You'll be amazed at how frequently they're in your food. And if you really wanna get granular well, about What about this, avocado oil mayonnaise? Uh, so most, uh, did you, have you seen the statistic that the majority of avocado oil is cut with vegetable oil these days? Most of it is adulterated. I have to talk to Mark Sisson about his avocado oil. I imagine that sure. if any if I have any avocado <laughs> oil is good, it's probably Mark's. Yeah. But like 80 plus percent of avocado oil is now cut with vegetable oil. Dirty dogs. Dirty dogs. So avocado oil is monounsaturated fat, right? Avocado mm -hmm. oil. So we're talking about how many double bonds are there in the chain. It's mostly oleic acid, which is an 18 carbon monounsaturated fat. Omega-6 PUFA is linoleic acid, 18 carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid. But I imagine Mark's is better. When people ask me about cooking oils, I just say use tallow. Use an animal-based oil. Well, what about, so tallow is the best. So we're talking about things to cook stuff in. Yeah. Tallow, number one for you. Uh -huh. Tallow is number one. duck fat. Duck fat, butter, if you tolerate a ghee, animal fats. Okay. Now the trick, there's a, there's a nuance with duck fat, right? Because if that duck is fed corn. <laughs> I told you I was gonna hurt you. <laughs> the duck is fed corn? Most of them are. What? I yeah. thought ducks just flew around <laughs> and fucking did they're, duck things. They're on duck farms. <laughs> they're on duck farms. Yeah, they're not wild ducks. Fucking yeah. ducks. So this gets a little granular, but I'll just, I'll just, if people's brains were full, I'm just gonna give you that one little wafer that's gonna cause them to explode right now. <laughs> like Monty Python. Um, so, Cows are ruminants and chickens and ducks and turkey and pigs are monogastric animals. And monogastric animals, humans included, incorporate polyunsaturated fatty acids into our body and we can't get rid of them quickly. Cows have this amazing way of taking polyunsaturated fatty acids in their diet and turning them into saturated fat. So if you feed a cow high polyunsaturated fat diet like corn and soy, which is not ideal for a cow, but in any way, shape or form, they will not accumulate polyunsaturated fat in their fatty tissue. If you feed a human corn, soy, or vegetable oil, or animals that are fed corn and soy, chicken, turkey, ducks, and pork, humans will accumulate polyunsaturated linoleic acid in their fatty tissue. One of the metrics that I think is gonna be something that doctors of the future look at is what are the levels of these fatty acids in your fat and in your red blood cells? Because you can see when people have eaten certain things in their diet that their linoleic acid level goes up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And you don't want your linoleic acid in the red blood cells or in the fat to be super high. That is correlated with all sorts of human problems. And it's really this indication that humans are eating badness, right? So you can tell. And when you're eating the foods that are full of these things, we start to bioaccumulate them. I've even seen, even seen some studies that make me super sad that it's like the half-life of these oils in the human body is 400 to 600 days. So this means that if someone is out there right now listening to this, cooking with canola oil because they're listening to their cardiologist, cooking with soybean oil, eating a lot of pork that's fed corn and soy, or you know, just doing things that are getting them lots of vegetable oils, if your fatty acid composition in your red blood cells- Is that probably the biggest problem with pork, you think? I is, think it is. is just because of the way that they process and what they're fed and the way they process it? Exactly, exactly. Mm. But if somebody has a high linoleic acid content in their fatty tissue and the red blood cells, that is gonna take a long time to get rid of. We, there may be ways to accelerate getting rid of that and we're thinking about, oh, if you, if you eat more animal fat and you have more stearic acid, for instance, can you push some of that polyunsaturated fat out? But this is the problem and this is probably why it takes some people so long 
to improve their underlying metabolic health. So anyway, I'm going on a lot of tangents here. Let's get back to tier one. But you had a great question, which is what's level one, what's 0.5, and what's 0.25? So the first thing I would say is get rid of those things in your diet. Sure. Make sure get that linoleic acid in your diet in all sources as low as you possibly can in terms of calories. You want it around two to 3%. And that I think, it'll take time, but that will result in profound metabolic improvements. And though we don't wanna talk about COVID, we don't have to talk about COVID, I really think that a lot of the metabolic dysfunction that seems to be driving COVID susceptibility is related to this excess linoleic acid in our diet and because of these things. And that's nut oils too. It, it is a lot part. of nut oils. It yeah. can be. Some of them are more monounsaturated, but you can look and see how much is there. So for instance, if you look, you know, if you want your calories to be under 3% linoleic acid, you can't eat a whole lot of oil that's 10% linoleic acid. Yeah. You know, you're gonna just gonna push it, push it up. I mean, it's not it's not the end of the world to eat olive oil, probably for most people. I think animal fats are better, but olive oil is about 10 to 12% linoleic acid. So it's higher than a ruminant. A cow, for instance, when I'm eating tallow or fat on a steak or suet, which is my favorite type of fat in a cow, it's the, the kidney fat. That kidney fat only has like 1.8% linoleic acid in it. Mm. Real difference between animal fat and then non, you know, like vegetable oil fats in terms of linoleic acid. Right. And there are other potential problems with vegetable fats, phytosterols, anyway, too much for today's podcast. What about what about fish? We haven't talked about fish yeah. almost at all. Yeah. So fish probably was okay 300 years ago. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like definitely our ancestors ate fish. We've put a lot of mercury and arsenic and cadmium into the oceans and even the people I work with who eat salmon that's wild caught in Alaska three times a week, I will see a bump in their mercury levels. And again, that's organic mercury, that's methyl mercury, it's not inorganic mercury, but I still worry about it. And I think, all right, yeah, fish is probably good, but know how much mercury and heavy metals, arsenic, cadmium, lead are in your fish. And I've said this before, and I, I think it's true. I, I really don't think I'm speaking with hyperbole here, or this is a, a false sort of image to give people. But eating fish to me seems like eating cows growing in the middle of Tokyo or in Wuhan. And not because of coronavirus, but if you look at where the worst air in the world is, right. it's in that part of China, right? Tokyo or Japan or Beijing. or So eat, would you eat a cow that was like grazing in a field in the middle of New York City? Like, uh, is they gonna eat? I'm a lot of pollutants, right? What about in, in Beijing? I mean, the air is so bad in Beijing that cow is just breathing that air all the time. Like probably eat it. Is it the best cow? Uh, probably not. But fish are just like breathing it all the time, man. The ocean yeah. is polluted, dude. And even worse are the more tasty fish or the shellfish, like scallops and mussels and oysters. So good. So high in metals because they're bent thick. They're on the bottom. Look at how much cadmium is in an oyster. A lot, which is a real bummer. So it's like you can eat them. Just realize like- Shrimps. Mm, like they're they're a shellfish, you know. They're you can look. I mean, look at how but they like, float around, man. They're not <laughs> on the bottom. They're, they're like in the middle. You, you, they're in the middle somewhere. I don't <laughs> know where fish are, but shrimp might be okay. Not on the bottom. Yeah, they're not totally bottom. Damn. Maybe they're in the middle. They're, 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 I think shrimp are okay. They've got lobsters some are kind of on the bottom too. Lobsters right? are just sitting there on the bottom, you know, like <laughs> junk falling on them. You're like, oh Son my god. A... But you can do the research. You can look like how much mercury, cadmium, and arsenic are in a lobster. How much is in a, a, a tuna? Not, don't do that. Tuna's super high. What is, just really quickly, and I know you go so deep, and I love that. But like, if you are concerned about the, your metal load, like, what is your recommendation for a chelation process that can actually help you release some of these metals? So there's a lot of ways to do this that are more or less severe or intense. Right. The first level is just sauna and making sure you have enough glutathione. The human body has a way to dispose of most metals. And if you look, there's some great research by, I think the guy's name is Stephen Genuis. They're, they have found levels of, of some heavy metals in the sweat that are higher than the blood, meaning that in the sauna and stuff, we can get rid of some of them. I believe mercury is one of the ones that will come out in the sweat. I'd have to look at his research to see if lead comes out. They don't all do, but some, they don't all come out in the sweat, but some of them do. So sauna is a great start. Mm -hmm. Giving your body enough glutathione and the nutrients needed to make glutathione is another key piece. If people are super toxic with metals, maybe this is one position where I would supplement with glutathione under the, the auspices or under the supervision of, of a provider. But your glutathione is how you get rid of metals in your body. It's one of the ways that you get rid of them. And the human body has a way to get rid of them. So you're getting rid of them. It's kind of this like bucket, right? There's a hole in the bottom of the bucket. If you're pouring stuff in, it's not gonna drain. So you wanna make that hold the bottom as big as possible. Get, let, let your body get rid of them. Make sure you're pooping and peeing. 
That's how your body gets rid of stuff and make sure your liver is working well. Don't eat pepper for the piperine, mm -hmm. right? So the reason I don't like black Which is pepper- is driving those booby traps deeper driving in Driving the system. boobies, driving those spikes deeper <laughs> in your guts, man. So the reason I don't like pepper is because there's a compound in pepper called piperine. And piperine inhibits UDP glucuronosyl transferase, which is the enzyme in your liver that adds a glucuronide moiety to toxins, one of which is curcumin. So we, we were talking about this. The reason we put pepper with curcumin is that the levels of curcumin in the human body go up like a thousand fold. Well, the reason they go up a thousand fold is because your body can't get rid of it. So your body's like, I want to get rid of this thing. And you're saying, nope, you're going to re-inhibit that enzyme and we're going to, and the curcumin is going to go way, way high. And in my book, like I said, I talk about potentially bad side effects with curcumin. Maybe it's not doing what we want. Yes, curcumin may have anti-inflammatory effects, but in the case of curcumin, why are you inflamed in the first place? Don't just whack them all. Don't just say like, I'm going to damp down my inflammation with curcumin, figure out why you're inflamed. Anyway, that's mm -hmm. my pepper aside as we got there. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think that the, the problem here is just that we don't actually understand how to detoxify these things generally as humans. And glutathione is a good start. Why would you why would you say you would only supplement with like intravenous glutathione in the case of a severe case of metal toxicity? Is there a, a down regulation of endogenous production of glutathione there is. if you supplement with it? There is. Yeah. And some people with certain polymorphisms can have sensitivity to this this excess cysteine coming in the glutathione. So mm -hmm. it's pretty benign, but some people don't do well with glutathione, either orally or IV. Mm -hmm. And you will sort of downregulate your body's production of glutathione. Is that been has that been conclusively shown? Because I've had I've kind of heard both sides really? of that with the glutathione, whether it downregulates endogenous or whether it doesn't. I'd have we have to look at the literature. Maybe there's literature out there that I'm not aware of, but I do mm -hmm. think that if you look at the biochemistry, if you pump a bunch of glutathione in, your body's not going to take homocysteine and turn it into the the precursors right. for glutathione because those enzymes are gonna get shut off. So there's homocysteine in like the folate cycle. And one of the pathways for homocysteine is to become thionine, which is when you have MTHFR going in there and folate and all this you know business with like methylfolate. The other pathway for homocysteine is to become cysteine or seleno, you know, these other types of cysteine, which are precursors for glutathione. So like N acetylcysteine? Well, not really. That's which sort is of the a supplement. That's that the supplement, take right. To because it. glutathione is three amino acids. So it's cysteine, glutamine, and glycine. And the rate limiting step is the the basically the formation of the the cysteine molecule with the acetyl group on the nitrogen. So right. it's it's sort of bypassing the the synthesis step in the glutamine. So basically the way to the way to just have good healthy glutathione's environmental hormesis and and nutrients that are used to make glutathione lots of glycine which we get in collagen and bone broth mm -hmm. and, and connective tissue and lots of b vitamins which are needed for the enzymes to make glutathione b6 which is in liver liver and yeah yeah so that's the way to do it eat animal foods even if you don't eat animal foods make sure you're getting enough b vitamins i obviously am an advocate for eating animal foods but get the b vitamins needed as cofactors to make glutathione and the right type of b vitamins the methylated forms methylated the forms yep. the bioavailable forms yep. one of the things that was fascinating for me was to find that there are forms of b vitamins in plants that humans don't absorb that well and i thought well that's not surprising it's like different operating systems that's a whole other concept i talk about in the book that it's fascinating to look that Animal forms of vitamins are different than plant forms of vitamins. Vitamin A is retinol versus beta carotene, totally different. A lot of people have to, if you eat beta carotene for vitamin A, there are multiple carotenoids that have been shown to be damaging for humans, but you have to have an enzyme called BCMO that works to cleave beta carotene into two molecules of retinol vitamin A. That doesn't happen very well in humans. Humans don't have any use for beta carotene. Mm. We have to make it into retinol vitamin A. And what's really striking here, and I think that vitamin A deficiency is rampant within our population because we mostly get most of our vitamin A from plants. And people think they're getting enough, but the representation of the amount of vitamin A in like a sweet potato, which is the highest, is inaccurate because the bioavailability of that vitamin A is so much lower. And there are studies, there's a study I quote in the book showing that you need, I think it's one to like 19,000. So like one unit of retinol vitamin A in liver is equivalent to 19,000 units of, of beta carotene. Wow. When you do the math for that, to get your recommended daily allowance for vitamin A in a day, you have to eat like a pound of sweet potatoes or more every day. And that's just for your RDA, which that's is just a for vitamin certainly a. Yeah. questionable and dubious for one number. Nutrient. <laughs> yeah. For one nutrient, picking the, picking the plant food, that's the highest in it.
Right. We didn't even talk about choline or any of these other, you know, you have to eat a, and then you have to eat a pound of broccoli to get the RDA for choline. That's impossible. You know, who wants to eat a pound of broccoli? A pound of, then you're done for the day and you didn't even get anything else. We haven't even, speaking of choline, we haven't even talked about eggs. We haven't talked about eggs. Choline's amazing. <clears throat> Super amazing. Comes so, in eggs. Comes in you eggs. Comes fuck in, with me here? Comes well, in liver. No, eggs are pretty good. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. Woo. So let me tell you about eggs. Woo, everybody. Right. We got a reprieve. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Sweet Can eat baby. Some eggs. Egg Jesus. <laughs> egg juice. <laughs> Fry <laughs> some eggs for Jesus. <laughs> so the thing about eggs that I've noticed clinically is that a lot of people are sensitive to the whites. If you do fine with the whites, great. What I usually recommend to people with a lot of autoimmunity is just do the yolk for a little while. And if you're getting good eggs, you can eat the yolks raw. You're not going to get salmonella or campylobacter. You'll be fine. That's on the shell. If you're really worried, you can wash the shell. But you crack the egg open. You just let the egg go into the sink, the white go into the sink. You get the yolk in your hand. And you can use it as a dressing on your steak. It's really good or whatever. But so I, I like people eating yolks. You don't have to eat them raw. Whatever. You can cook the yolks. Get over that anyone. tallow eggnog. Right. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> with but, no spices. <laughs> No spice, right? No spice. Uh, yeah. But eggs, egg yolks are rich in that stuff. Now, depending what the eggs are, what the chickens are eating, right? So here's the other thing. Traditional eggs, depending, are coming from traditional chickens. Traditional chickens are fed corn and soy. So though this is- And they're is, like pigs. They can't process that stuff They can't process well that stuff. So the linoleic acid content of egg yolks is probably higher than it should be. Is it the worst thing? No. I rather would have people eating eggs. But the amount of linoleic acid in eggs is way less than the amount of linoleic acid in like vegetable oil or a big fatty piece of pork. But if you're just doing one thing like that, do eggs because they're so rich in choline and vitamin A and they have good folate. They're great, powerful foods for humans. But be aware that if you're eating 12 eggs a day and those eggs are fed corn and soy, you got to think about how much linoleic acid you're getting from you that. You need those Joe Rogan chicken eggs. You do. Does Joe Rogan have good chickens? Well, he does until the animals, the other animals, kill him. the <laughs> raccoons fucking kill him and stuff. So he's had a constant battle. But like, yeah, he has his own chicken coop and they just graze out there and they're cruising around and they're eating worms and they're doing what chickens do. They're being carnivore chickens. They're eating they're eating mice and worms or whatever. And, yeah. and, and you know when chickens do that because their eggs are like a freaking tequila sunrise. Yeah. You know, they're, they're orange as hell. And there's a great farm Dick, here in town. Orange. I don't know if you've ever gotten stuff from Shirt Tail Creek at the farmer's market. Their mm -hmm. eggs are the most orange I've ever seen in my whole life. Cool. Super good. So that's how you know, right? If your eggs are like yellow, you guys, they're eating corn and soy. They ain't good. Yeah. I guarantee you that the eggs from Joe and everybody else that does chickens the right way are just like super, super orange. Yeah. So so we were at the tier one carnivore diet, right? So it's like meat and eggs. Get some liver in there if you want. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to do liver, get some, some desiccated heart. organs, some heart. Those are pretty easy organs. And then eat your fruit. Eat your fruit and see how you feel. It's that's a great start. Now, what about what about the people who are trying to steer towards nutritional ketosis, mm -hmm. which has you know a variety of different right. benefits? Um, obviously, because of gluconeogenesis, with all that much protein, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And then you add fruit, and then it's going to be even more difficult. Um, so are those two like ideas mutually exclusive? If you're saying carnivore, well, you're going to kind of leave nutritional ketosis on the table or there, is there a way to kind of bring those together? There is. And I kind of hinted this earlier. So fast forwarding a little bit, you know, I did a, a strictly zero carb animal based carnivore diet for a year and a half. And I felt really good in the gym. My physique stayed the same. I was sleeping pretty good. And I, you know, I just ended up in this point where the one thing that was bugging me was muscle cramps. And I've heard this a lot of times from people, and I would occasionally get palpitations. People who do nutritional ketosis, levels of ketones 0.5 millimolar or greater for long amounts of time, a year, six months, et cetera, will often run into problems with electrolytes. And so they're just doing all this minerals. I was just chasing my electrolytes like a dog chasing its tail, up and back and up and back. It's crazy. And I just thought, you know what? This doesn't make any sense. Like, I think our ancestors actually ate carbohydrates from time to time. Mm. It's not to say that that you know ketones are not valuable or that low carbohydrate diets are not incredibly healing for humans or that our ancestors were not in ketosis frequently, but I also think they were flipping back and forth. And so what you see is, and this is there's so many rabbit holes to go down here, but when humans eat carbohydrates and protein together, you get a big insulin spike, which is physiologic and normal and not pathologic. It's been overly vilified in my opinion. And with that big insulin spike, your body holds on to a lot of sodium. When you hold on to sodium, you can hold on to magnesium and potassium. It's not about how many electrolytes you're taking in. It's about how many electrolytes you retain. Because many people who have done this, keto, carnivore, 
you can pump potassium and magnesium into you all day till you're blue in the face and pooping out your butt and getting diarrhea and you'll still get muscle cramps. You will still get muscle cramps. And so it's not about how much you are taking in. It's about how much you're retaining. So I think that physiologically, humans appear to be built to do ketosis for a few days and then to probably get some carbohydrates. Mm. Like you're starving for a few days or you're starving for a few weeks and then you're getting some insulin signaling. But if you go much longer than that, a lot of people do run into some pretty profound electrolyte deficiencies. If you're doing nutritional ketosis and you're not having that, then great, you're lucky, I did. Mm. So I added back carbohydrates in my diet. People say, you're not carnivore, but listen, listen guys. So I, I start. <laughs> not a lot of people are saying that, Paul. <laughs> like, I, I don't know who's saying that here. I think you pretty much got the credibility. <laughs> So the, the first carbohydrate I added was honey. And that's been my favorite one. I subsequently did a continuous glucose monitor thing from NutriSense and I added in berries. I didn't like the way that felt. I added in squash. My body does not like fiber, but I could see the glucose responses. And what I learned was that my body will not go crazy with honey. I do this organic uh, raw honey and I'll get a blood sugar spike maybe from like 80 to 120, which is not pathologic, guys. I have a whole continuous glucose monitor podcast on my podcast about this, but I show you all my blood sugars. And after months and months of eating honey every single day, and I'm not talking about a small amount of honey, 100 plus grams of carbohydrates with honey every day, you can see my fasting insulin stays low. I don't become insulin resistant. And I recently just did my blood work. My fasting insulin is less than three micro IU per ml. And my C-peptide is 0.48 or 0.43. For anyone who knows those metrics, those are basically the bottom of the reference range. Those are below the bottom of the reference range. Like mm -hmm. I do not have insulin resistance from carbohydrates. Carbohydrates do not cause insulin resistance. That is, that is really something that I feel very strongly about. And we shouldn't be fear-mongering about carbohydrates causing insulin resistance processed food is a problem well it's the type of carbohydrate then is what you're talking about type of then. carbohydrate leads to overeating carbohydrates but naturally occurring food carbohydrates do not cause insulin resistance in humans right. so it's quantity mm. and type quantity and type right and it would be interesting to see if i could induce insulin resistance in myself by eating like three pounds of honey but i think i would get food fatigue eating a natural food before i would do that at any time in human history you're good luck or what are you a bear <laughs> i know like, right? i don't think you could eat three pounds <laughs> of honey. you'd have to go really freaking far because i eat a lot of honey and i am not insulin resistant shown by cgm shown by fasting glucose what's your favorite type of honey uh the one i'm eating now is ys eco bee farms but there's a good place in austin called what is it like Good flow or something. Yeah, yeah. Austin brand. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. So too. raw honey, obviously. Raw organic honey. Yeah. 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 And uh, what's the, there's a lot of hype about manuka honey. Is that just all marketing <sighs> thing? I think it might be hype. It's darn expensive. I haven't it's had enough. Super expensive. If there's any manuka honey companies out there, you want to send me some manuka honey in glass, I'll gladly try your stuff. But I'm not paying fifty bucks for a jar that's this big. We uh, used to have raw killer bee honey. That oh, that's a, oh, that's good. I've <laughs> that's had that. Cool. I've had that killer bee honey before. The I like that stuff too. Killer bee honey's honey's dang. amazing, man. Honey's a whole separate thing, but. You know, I found that incorporating carbohydrates in my diet, and you can even make, if we want to get semantic, you can make an argument that honey is carnivore. It's made by bees, you know? Right. It's not a plant food. It's an animal-based carbohydrate. But I do think, like you suggested, there are benefits to ketosis. The way that I structure my eating is I'll eat breakfast and a late lunch. So I'll eat lunch at like, you know, today I eat at like noon. I'll probably have a little bit of food when I go home today at like three or four. That'll be my last meal of the day. And when I wake up in the morning, I've been checking my ketones, I'm at 0.5 millimolar. So overnight, I'm getting all the benefits of ketosis. I am exhausting the glycogen in my liver, mm. which means all the AMP kinase pathways are turning on, mTOR is turning off. I'm doing this, quote, cellular house cleaning. I'm getting the benefits of ketosis. I'm flipping the NAD to NADH2 ratio a little bit. I'm turning on sirtuins. I'm getting all these benefits of being in a fasted ketogenic state, but it's cyclical. And my cycle is a day. And I've just said, okay, that's great. Cause I'll do this eight hour eating window and even doing over a hundred grams of carbohydrates a day. I'll be back in ketosis by the next morning and ketosis being 0.5 millimeter millimolar. So like clinical ketosis, I think a lot of people get wrapped up in ketone levels and they don't need to chase numbers. Right. If you have 0.2 or 0.3, you have ketones. You and have also like, if you're, if you're really listening to your body, yeah, you should feel it. You like should you feel can, it. You can feel when you're in ketosis or not. Yeah. When you, especially when you get used to it and you track it. Yeah. Just the clarity, the energy, a lot of the things that are come through. And I just feel like it's it's not productive for humans to chase ketones. We don't want to chase ketones. You don't need to chase like higher levels of ketones. You know, 
maybe for some people who have like brain tumors, there's research perhaps with glioblastoma multiforme. We, we may want that. But the majority of people, they get hung up. Like, I want to have my ketones as high as possible. And they're just pumping them up with MCTs. And, oh, look, my ketones are great. And we just don't know that that means anything for humans. Right. I think the main metabolic switch is that you have some ketones. You have more than trace that ketones. That you have like what Sisson talks about is like a dual energy system. Exactly. You, you can want burn glycogen to and you can use ketones. Yep. So when you get through that liver glycogen, then your body makes ketones. And I love Mark's thinking around that because he's totally right. You don't have to be low carb every day. You can be in ketosis every single morning mm. and eat tons of carbs every day. You know, I had a guy reach out to me. He said he was like training for the Olympics. And he's like, I just feel like I lose a gear when I do full carnivore, but I but plant foods make my gut feel bad. And I was like, what about honey? And he was like, I never thought about that. I was like, great. I can't wait to hear what you think because that's been my experience too. I don't know that I necessarily gained a gear. I'm not an elite athlete, but I sure like to move and I like to exercise. I didn't see a whole lot of performance you know, decline, but I'm not in there like knowing my deadlift sure. every single day or competing at elite level of jujitsu or anything like that. So I don't know what to say. I was just mostly casual surfing and lifting and throwing kettlebells around. I didn't see a main, a big problem with it, but I certainly feel pretty good with the honey every day right now. And it gives you a lot of flexibility. What about something like, you know, we talked briefly about dairy, but <clears throat> obviously we drink human milk, right? So and there's been some people who've said, and I think there's some research that shows from a molecular level that goat milk is a lot closer to human milk. So like, what are your thoughts on goat dairy? Yeah. So there's an interesting nuance here. And again, I talk about this in the book. There's A1 versus A2 milk. And this has to do with the isoform of casein and casomorphine that is you know, derived from the casein. So for a lot of people, I think, the casein and the whey are the immunogenic proteins. And there are some studies that suggest that A2 milk, which comes from certain types of cows, Jersey cows or Guernsey cows, a lot of them are A2. They have this K2 isoform of casein, they're different genetics, or buffalo milk or camel milk or goat's milk or sheep's milk. These are all A2 milks. But personally, I thought, oh, I love milk. I love cheese. I just want to eat these. My eczema came back every single time. Even with the A2s? Even with A2s, even with raw goat's milk dairy. And I could try human milk. I, I, I have. They, you have? I have. They have human milk ice cream places in New York, I hear. It's amazing. I've never tried that, but I have tried human Would milk. Would you? I've definitely done honey it. Honey sweetened, human honey milk. sweetened human milk ice cream. <laughs> I think it would probably, <laughs> I think it probably still wouldn't be great for me, but I have tried what? human milk. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Humans only eat milk for a short amount of time. And this actually goes back to the ideas around carbohydrates and fat. If you look at human milk, we don't actually know how much linoleic acid is supposed to be in human milk. Because human milk from mainstream moms has uh, like 10 to 12% linoleic so acid. So we need carnivore fed it human be, mom. Maybe breast milk sweetened with honey. <laughs> or or it's possible that milk is just made to make babies as fat as possible to survive a very vulnerable period. And we're not meant to drink it our whole life, even from a boob, mm. you know? I wasn't planning on drinking human milk anyway, so Come that's, on. Okay. that's you, okay, you would Paul. do it. I no, know you I would. I am do. actually grossed out by that. <laughs> no, uh, that does do. not sound appealing to me at all. <laughs> but I was just trying to throw that out there. But all right, so for you, what you've experienced is maybe A2 is, you know, marginally better. Marginally better for some people but still not actually going to. Didn't work for me. I think it still doesn't work for a lot of people. So see what works for you. Like I said, there are indigenous people like the Maasai who make milk a lot of their diet. I think there are some people genetically who can they tolerate also drink dairy. Blood. They do drink, which is a delicious if you've never tried it. No, I don't agree. It tastes <laughs> salty and like pennies. <laughs> Haven't you ever like sucked a cut? It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, not terrible. It's okay. I guess the blood that I've had is gone like, down on your your woman. No, it's like during hard. that time of the month, true, you know, but... just coming up looking like a wolf. <laughs> You've never never experienced that delight. I've, I'm ex I'm thinking about like now, you call yourself a real carnivore, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about like liver, you, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking about liver. You know, when you get a liver from the butcher and you just put the liver in a glass container, it just a lot of blood comes out, and I'll just drink that. I'm like, Whoa, that's that's rich. <laughs> That's like, that's varsity it's intense, level, bro. bro. You don't have to Yeah, that's yet. level five. We'll get you there. <laughs> no, like... no, probably not. <laughs> probably will not get me there. I will stop probably at level 1.25. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. But level 1.25 will probably be 98 I'll feel so fucking good exactly. because when I get to level 0.1, I'm like, oh, I'm feeling way right, better. Right. Like just these modular increases. Yeah. 
Like you don't need to go full carnivore here to start to feel the benefits because I'm a perfect example of this. All of those depressive conditions that I felt, which I thought were doing with something in my head, well, everything in my head is really, really, it could not be better. The last thing that I hadn't modified was some of these aspects of my diet. So the last few months, I've been really focusing on that. And I can just feel it in my body, everything just getting happier and happier every every single day that I cut these out. And then I vary it. I go off like I had a pizza one night. I was like, fuck it, I'll just have pizza. Uh, and then the depression symptoms came back. And I was like, all right, well, fucking pizza's out. Powerful. Yeah. Powerful, it's right? pa- When you start to make that correlation, then you look at that pizza. It's like, yeah, it's for sure delicious in my mouth. This little mouth pleasure right. in this small little area in my tongue and the signals in my brain saying, yeah, do it, bro. Yeah, do it, bro. Yeah, do it. And I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah. Like, I know better. Right. And so I think that it's important for people to experience that. And that's why things like a carnivore challenge can be super valuable. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this with my friends. I'm going to do, and don't think about, if people want to try this, don't think about the rest of your life as carnivore, even carnivore-ish. Don't think, I'm never going to eat hot dogs or I'm never going to eat pizza again. Just think, try two weeks. If you can't do two weeks, do 10 days. If you can do two weeks, do a month. If you can do a month, do two months. If you can do two months, you will feel the difference. And you will have this experience in your brain like, I remember like you've kind of like you're tiptoeing and putting your toe in the water. You're like, I've had this experience. I remember it. You don't always have to live there. That's your choice. You want to go eat whatever you want. You know, you can do that, but you have this experience. You know what? I did those two months of carnivore or a month of carnivore. I felt so good. I would like jump out of bed. I got my abs back or whatever. You know, my, my biceps got bigger. I felt good. So having that experience really changes people's knowledge. It gives them a framework. Like I've been to Luxembourg. You know yeah, what yeah, Luxembourg yeah. looks like. I've been to Burning Man. Yeah. I know what I know. You've been what it's to like. Burning Man, if right? You haven't been to Burning Man, you don't know what it's fucking like. All right. So we we're both close with Kyle Kingsbury. Uh-huh. He went strict carnivore, probably level three at least. Right. right. And maybe level five, the dude's extreme. Right. And he got a rash. Right. So the carnivore rash. What, right. What is this phenomenon? Now Paul Check said that this was actually the detoxification of oxalates that was happening too fast because he went from, you know something that was eating a lot of a lot of greens cooked greens of course because that reduces the amount of oxalates right but is that is that a, is that a thing like what was what was causing Kyle's rash was this another just correlating you know variable or was is this something that is can happen with going carnivore too quick it's real and we see it on keto too people talk about a keto rash and a carnivore rash so i don't think we understand this physiology i was never taught about it in medical school there's something happening in humans and there's a lot of changes. So when you go carnivore, when Kyle went strict carnivore, he cut out plants. He might have been oxalate dumping, but he was also changing his metabolism and being in ketosis. So is this the same thing that happens for people in ketosis? Is, is this related to a ketogenic physiology? You know, with Kyle, it would have been interesting to go back, or if he does it again, to be like, add honey in, bro. See if we just change one variable and you're mm-hmm. not in ketosis as much does the rash go away. Is this related to something having to do with detoxification from beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate or some other epigenetic modification that's happening because of ketones? We don't know. Or it certainly could be oxalate dumping. My goodness, the realm of oxalates are fascinating. They're so fascinating. We don't even know what these are doing in the human body, but there's pretty interesting evidence that when humans eat a lot of oxalates, they accumulate in the thyroid and the breast tissue and all kinds of places, muscle tissue. They've done thyroid biopsies or they've actually looked at autopsies. Like 70 to 80% of people had oxalate deposition in the thyroid. There's no biological role for oxalic acid in the thyroid. It's not supposed to be there. Oxalic acid is a breakdown product of proline and hydroxyproline in the human body. We make a very small amount of oxalic acid in the human body every day. We excrete it. And some people, when they eat really high oxalate foods, spinach, chocolate, curcumin, or turmeric, really high in oxalates, they get oxalate kidney stones because they don't get rid of it or they don't have as good of a detoxification mechanism and they get these calcium oxalate kidney stones. Western medicine knows about this. If you get a kidney stone, the majority of them are calcium oxalate, they're going to tell you to eat a low oxalate diet, which is all the plant foods. You know, They're not going to tell you to stop eating meat because there's no oxalates in meat. There's some thinking that excess collagen will increase oxalates, but I think that's a much smaller problem than like the massive amount of oxalates in spinach. So if oxalates are depositing in thyroid, breast tissue, and all these places, there's even some suggestion that they could be causing this vulvovaginal pain syndrome in women, vulvo, vulvodyna. And it's like, wow, that, that sucks. Which basically, it hurts when you have sex. Well, it even hurts when you sit for women. 
Mm. Yeah, because it's such as, you know, it's getting all the pressure. So some of these, there's a whole vaginal pain foundation online. Sally K. Norton, I think, is somebody that's spoken about that. She had this bubble vaginal pain. It got so much better when she got rid of the oxalates. But there is a lot of clinical evidence that if we're eating a bunch of oxalates, if you are crushing kale and spinach smoothies with almonds and, and turmeric, which a lot of people might be, and you have a lot of oxalates and you stop, it's totally possible we're dumping. We just don't know this yet in medicine. Right. I have seen in clients and other people that when they go carnivore, their urinary oxalates go up. And you go, well, that's weird. Are you, is that a dumping? It's very possible. So that's totally- Well, you're not getting, you're not bringing in new oxalates. You're not bringing so you in new oxalates. You have to be re releasing oxalates. Yeah. There's nothing else that makes sense unless there's some biochemical process that's happening. Yeah. yeah. But that's unlikely. It could, the only other possibility is that you're eating so much collagen that your body's breaking that collagen down into oxalate. But I think it's more likely that it's coming out of the tissue and that you're releasing oxalates in the urine with the tissue. And so Kyle's rash could have definitely been that. It's what about Kyle's diarrhea? So the so, diarrhea is fascinating. I know Joe got really bad diarrhea too, and I really right. wanted to talk to him. I don't know Joe yet, but I was like, oh, I was talking to Mark Bell. I was like, send this message to Joe if you can get it to him. Mm -hmm. So diarrhea is really interesting on carnivore. And I'll, this is what I think is going on. So the small intestine is this 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 long intestine. So first connects. of all, you're, you're shitting logs. I poop logs every day. I'll send you a photo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very clear about this in the book. Like I have perfect poops every day, bro. It's beautiful. <laughs> I've been pooping logs like every day for the last, <laughs> but for the first few weeks I did carnivore, I had diarrhea. Okay. I did. Yeah. It wasn't perfect. Some people get no problems with diarrhea. I had diarrhea for two or three weeks and then I've been pooping logs ever since. Some people get diarrhea that doesn't go away. And so when you eat meat and fat, your, your gallbladder releases bile. What's in bile? It's bile acids, cholesterol, and bilirubin. Okay. What do bile acids do? Bile acids emulsify fats. They allow your body to take up fats by emulsifying them, making these micelles, making them more bioavailable in your small intestine. One of the roles of the small intestine is to reabsorb bile acids. And if when you get to the ileum, which is the end of your small intestine, where the ileum connects with a large bowel, it's called the ileocecal valve, 95% of those bile salts are supposed to be reabsorbed. And I think that a lot of people who are eating tons of fiber the small intestine is just not used to reabsorbing that many bile salts. When you get rid of fiber and you're eating meat and fat, you are pumping bile salts into your small intestine like crazy. And your small intestine's like, whoa, I've never seen this many bile salts. It either, I think it's a combination of small intestinal healing that is happening and the small intestine upregulating the mechanisms to pull the bile salts back in. And then the diarrhea resolves. But if you don't do that, if too many of those bile salts, if more than 5% of the bile salts released by your gallbladder make it into the colon, they cause diarrhea. They're cathartic. And we know this because you can supplement with like ox bile. Sometimes it helps people who are underproducing bile. They can supplement. With, it's actual bile from an ox. Mm. And they will get diarrhea because you're giving your body too much bile with the bile salts. It moves to the colon. You get this catharsis and then you get diarrhea. It was interesting to hear Joe's story. He had diarrhea. He was like, I can't trust my butthole. And then it stopped. It got better. So like something adjusted and yeah. then he's absorbing it. So when people get that, I recommend that they go more slowly in the transition off of fiber and add a little bit of like avocado or something, which will bind the bile salts. And usually the stool firms up very quickly and you kind of taper off the fiber if the diarrhea doesn't go away for a few weeks or if you need to like live your life because it's pretty interesting, but it's a right. fascinating physiology. But yeah, and I have a lot of friends who are carnivore now and I check with all of them. Are you pooping? Yeah, I poop great. Okay, great. So it's interesting physiology. So that idea that you need the fiber because meat has very little fiber. Fiber. Meat doesn't have fiber, but it has animal fiber. So we can talk about this. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. There are like the collagen in meat can be broken down by bacteria in our gut in a similar way to the plant fiber. And there, that's a whole other rabbit hole we can go down, but right. we call it animal. I call it animal fiber in the gut. So you can get animal fiber if you're eating collagen, but it doesn't really bind the bile salts in the same way that plant fiber does. Right. All right. You mentioned bacteria, and this leads me to probably one of the last rabbit holes I want to go down is what about your gut biome? Yeah. You know, what is the effect of the carnivore diet on the gut biome? Because the conventional narrative is you need prebiotic fiber in order to feed the gut biome, you know, properly. Of course, the probiotics as well is another factor, especially if when they've been depleted by antibiotics. But what is the effect of the carnivore diet on your gut biome? So this is actually really interesting. So there are many ways to approach this. So we don't know in 2020, you know, in August of 2020, we don't actually know what a healthy microbiome is. And anyone that says otherwise is really just kind of conjecture, mm -hmm. you know? Many of the species that we consider to be healthy 
don't even occur in like hunter-gatherers. For instance, bifidobacteria, the Hadza don't even have it. <laughs> so for anyone to say, this diet doesn't have fiber, it decreases lacto and bifido, therefore it's not healthy, it's like, well, you're kind of jumping, you're going from A to F, and there's a lot of B, C, D, E, E there, right? You know, like in the middle, we don't actually know that. You can't say that you need these species to have a healthy gut. What I've always felt is that if you are healthy as a human and you're pooping regularly, you have a healthy gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong with my microbiome. Especially if your inflammatory markers are low. Right, if your inflammatory yeah. markers are low. And if you wanted to be very granular about it, you could do a gut test and I've done this. One of the metrics that we use, which is imperfect for a healthy microbiome is alpha diversity, which is just a measure of the number of species in any given ecosystem. And I've done this repeatedly on my gut. I've actually got a test coming that'll hopefully be back next week on my updated alpha diversity. But when you look at a human gut and you look at my gut, or this has actually been studied at Harvard, they took a group on a plant-based diet and they actually put a group on a carnivore diet. This is crazy. Yeah, they did this. So the carnivore diet, this is one interventional trial with a carnivore diet looking at gut flora. It was a seven day study. People say, oh, it's too short. But when you think about it, gut flora changes within four days. So it's not yeah, too short. They don't short. live that long. Yeah, they, they recycle in three to four days. And the carnivore diet was not an ideal carnivore diet. They were not giving them collagen and connective tissue and bone broth. They were basically eating like salami and hot dogs. The researchers were trying to show a problem here. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, I mean, this is Harvard. Like the Harvard, yeah. the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard is funded by so many plant-based interest groups, it's ridiculous. And everything coming out of there, Walter Willett, appears to be pretty darn biased. So these were, they were trying to make it look bad. But what they found, I'm surprised the study even got published, was that the alpha diversity did not change between the two groups. So removing fiber from the human diet does not decrease alpha diversity. And I've seen this in myself and many carnivores. We usually, I mean, in the past, I've had a very high alpha diversity. Now, again, it's an imperfect metric, but in terms of diversity in my gut, in people I've worked with and other people anecdotally in the space, doesn't go down when you remove fiber. Conversely, there are also interventional studies where they give people fiber supplements, alpha diversity doesn't go up. So if anyone says, fiber increases alpha diversity, I haven't seen the study and I think that they're wrong. And I've seen multiple studies to argue against that. So plant fiber doesn't increase alpha diversity, removal doesn't decrease alpha diversity. So basically then what you're looking at is, okay, alpha diversity doesn't change with a carnivore diet. Do species change? Absolutely. Is that a negative thing? I don't know. You're giving them more protein and fat. <laughs> You know, mm. like, of course you're going to get more bile acid tolerant organisms. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And I think that if, what is the end game here? People say your, your gut microbiome is unhealthy. Okay. You think that might manifest with like pain or bloating or diarrhea or bloody stools or inflammatory bowel disease. Carnivores have some of the most quiescent, calm, chilled out guts I've ever seen. I mean, right. I don't even remember when I farted today, dude. <laughs> Do you think that there's some of the effect? I mean, one of the big problems with a lot of people's guts is candida overgrowth. Right. Candida albicans in the gut, which competes with the kind of shelf space for all the bacteria on your on your intestinal lining and everything else that's in there. The candida feeds off of a lot of these carbohydrates and a lot of these different things, from my understanding of it. I think that that I think that that is an overly simplified paradigm because I haven't seen that to be the case. So I think that. If somebody has a candle overgrowth and you put a bunch of sugar in, it's going to make it worse. Uh -huh. But often the removal of the sugar doesn't fix the candida in everyone. I think that the problem with the microbiome is that we're thinking about it incorrectly. Like it's not so much about one species. It's about the 17 species that are tasked with keeping the candida in check. And those are the ones that are missing, right? Mm. So when there's a problem in the gut, I don't think it's as much about taking one species out or inserting one species. It's about creating a community. It's an ecosystem. right? And you know how an ecosystem works, right? I mean, a grassland animal is a good example. Like a cow eats grass upon which bugs live and it poops on the ground, which creates a mycorrhizal network and the root network. And, you know, there's worms and bugs and beetles and they're all kind of interacting. Or, you know, there's, there's a life cycle, right? And so- it's the same way in our gut. There's an ecosystem and there's all these species and you can't really simplify it to like one species or another species. I really think candela overgrowth is a, is a problem that's based on what we call dysbiosis. And it probably has to do with loss of keystone species and loss of alpha diversity, which is allowing the candida to thrive. It's not so much that somebody has candida, like you get infected with candida and therefore you're stuck with it and you have to eradicate it with an antibiotic. It's that you or well, I- You can't eradicate it with antibiotic. It actually exacerbates it, it's but an antifungal- It usually comes back, yeah. right? Which doesn't make any sense, right? If you can give, you could give Diflucan or Nystatin 
and and you should be able to kill all that candidate, but it comes right back because no doubt. it's pervasive in our environment, right? Everything you eat has a little bit of candida on it. Just like everything you eat, nothing is sterile, right? My fingers, nothing is sterile. There's candida everywhere. And it's not so much about that you have it or you don't, it's that you don't have the other bacteria that are supposed to keep it in check. So, but net effect, it's from everything that you research and everything you've experienced that eating a carnivore diet will reduce candida overgrowth and create the kind of diversity that actually supports gut symbiosis, not dysbiosis. It seems to really help clinically. I can't even tell you the number of times people have reached out to me and said, I was a vegan and I farted all the time. <laughs> for you sure. That's a, that's a for sure. <laughs> right? The vegan fart patio is a well-known well right? known thing, right? Or, like, or I thought I was I was paleo and I Go to a was... vegan restaurant that doesn't have an outdoor seating. Right. Like, good right, luck. Right, Find yeah. that. Show me that. Show me a picture. <laughs> or I was paleo and I thought that I was doing the right thing. I mean, if you go to most and I don't I mean, if you if you go to if you just listen to most ideology of health pundits today, the reason you have GI problems is because you need to eat more fiber. <laughs> Because right. you're not getting enough plants. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe you need to eat less fiber. Mm. And that is so healing for some people. They're just like, oh my gosh, I, my gut is so quiet. I've never felt this before. And I definitely think that it's not about these magical species, lacto or bifido, that you need plant fiber to create to help the candidate. It's about this dysbiosis. And we are 20 to 40 years away. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. That's my sense from really understanding the way that this very chaotic and complex network in the human gut works. We have thousands of species. We need a supercomputer. We need big machine learning to really understand this. Can I do a fecal transplant with your poop, Paul? Now <laughs> we'll talk that about after the now podcast. That we're homies. It's going to cost you. <laughs> Come on, man. We just went through a workout. You know, like, I don't know. We'll, we'll barter. We'll we'll bar I'm just bartering for your shit, man. <laughs> Come on. Uh, all right. I've so always thought that this would be like <laughs> the ultimate gold mine, you know? <laughs> To become a well, this is actually, uh, I'm joking. But you're, you're the A1 donor of that's, feces. Right? My, because my of poop, your... you guys heard it here first. <laughs> I will sell you my poop for 500, I'm not gonna do this. $500 of poop, it means, man, I don't even have to work anymore, Aubrey. I'll I just take get, it. I'll I just take get to poop it. every day. I mean, the, I, just, I think actually that's a frontier of medicine for people with gut dysbiosis is oh, fecal transplants FMTs. is fucking powerful. Super powerful, absolutely. And what's crazy for me is like dogs eat poop. Have you ever heard of yellow soup? It's this thing in Chinese medicine. It's like either human poop or baby poop is yellow soup. So like people have been doing FMTs forever. We're super afraid of poop, but there's no better probiotic in my opinion. Of course, there's fear with, you could get a bad bug that somebody has in their gut, but I mean, they've helped a lot of people. Well, there's, there's research showing that in World War II, I think they figured out that eating camel dung actually cured dysentery. <sighs> So like, there's a lot of interesting things going, but that's actually going the, I mean, that's, you have to deal with it in your stomach then. You have to deal with all the other stuff in there. Better to get it up the other way, you know? Again. If you had dysentery, would you eat camel dung? I mean, if I didn't have any other options, I'll especially after reading Travis Christopherson's <laughs> book, you know, it worked, worked well for everybody. And then yeah. they developed penicillin and that actually cured dysentery as well, but it also completely depleted the gut. Whereas the camel dung had a particular type of bacterial strain, which right. outcompeted the bacteria that was causing the dysentery in the first place. And so that's what the Bedouin cultures used to cure their dysentery. It's like, oh, we'll just follow a camel around for a little while and eat their fresh dung and we'll be fucking good. It's brilliant. But it's it's bold but it worked and that's i think just interesting way to an interesting tangent to think about uh we'll talk about me getting some of your poop later <laughs> all right last thing we got to talk about and this podcast has been fucking incredible and long and so if you could condense i think the final argument a lot of us have been convinced myself included that everything you're saying sounds incredibly reasonable um well okay first lightning round uh coffee it's a no for me because it's a roasted plant seed. Okay, so you tea, matcha mm. tea? No, because it's really it's brewed Oof. plant. Blue, How blue do you get leaves. caffeine? I don't do caffeine. <laughs> so caffeine's out? No. I mean, okay, so the, I, again, it's all framed in like, what's your goal? If you have an illness, do an elimination diet, add things back in one at a time, uh -huh. right? I know plenty of carnivores who are perfectly healthy, happy with their lives who drink coffee. I'm not saying coffee causes problems in everyone. I just don't drink it because I'm trying to be the... The, the astronaut. You're the poop donor. I get I, it. I'm the, I'm the A1 poop donor. <laughs> I'm the astronaut. I'm the pirate, you know? Yeah. So I don't do coffee or caffeine or matcha. You know, I love Ocean Lab here in town for floating. And they always say afterwards, like, hey, do you want to, do you want some tea? And I'm like, you guys, I don't do plants. They're like, oh yeah, you're the guy who wrote the carnivore book. Uh -huh. I don't do tea. Okay. And then final lightning round question. You're cooking a steak. 
obviously sea salt mm -hmm. good to go there what else can you put probably garlic's a no i don't do anything else I just do what about salt. some like rosemary or something like that still i don't do it i think rosemary is going to be less offensive Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, we were talking about this before. Rosemary is an herb. It's a plant leaf. It's going to be less problematic for most people than a seed, like a, like a spice. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think if people are really trying to just get rid of all the plants, get rid of the rosemary and then reintroduce it. It's probably fine for most people. And it's such a small dose, but I just don't even feel the need for it. Yeah. All right. And so I cook my steaks. We talked about this earlier, but I'll just share it with the listeners. I really like to cook my steaks in bone broth. So I've gotten super into cooking steak in a pan with bone broth and I blanch the meat. And people always want to know what I eat. So is it okay if I talk about that? Of course. So I, I get a lot of stew meat. There's a lot of good farms, White Oak Pastures, Belcampo, Shirtail Creek. I don't know if you like any particular farms, but mm -hmm. I get stew meat. It's super affordable. One of the knocks I hear from people is, I can't eat your diet. That's 50 bucks a day. The meat that I eat is less than $10 a pound. It's grass-fed and grass-finished and from a regenerative farm. It's stew meat. And I'll take bone broth that I've made in my Instant Pot for super cheap, and I'll put it in a pan, I'll boil it, and I'll blanch the, the stew meat in the, in the bone broth. I'm a simple man. And then I'll put on some Redmond Real Salt, and I will do organs. And we didn't talk a lot about the organs, but I think it's important for people to know that like liver is super important, heart is super important. It fills in a lot of these sort of parts in the in the, you know, in the nutritional spectrum. And so if people can't do that, the desiccated organs are good. And that's why we did this heart and soil, which is my new exciting thing. Mm -hmm. So heart and soil supplements.com. This is desiccated organs. So both of those can work for people to get their organ meats in, but then I'll do that. And I'll do some special fat, the suet, which I like because it's high in stearic acid. And then I'll do some egg yolks occasionally and I'll do honey. And that's what I eat twice a day. Mm. And that's my meals. And I love the simplicity. Some people need the entertainment. And we can talk about that when you yep. come on my podcast. And, <laughs> because that's about, then we're using food as entertainment, which right. is a problem for people. So right. All but right. that's so how we last, last lightning round before we get to the final question, which is what if everybody became carnivore, which I want to get to. The final question is, all right, caffeine, it's hard. If you have to have caffeine, what do you think is the most innocuous way to get caffeine? Good question. Um, I haven't thought about this a lot, but I do think that some people need caffeine. If you're driving long distance, you know, for an emergency, if you're on a night shift as a nurse, if you're on call as a physician, like I've been in the past, or if you're studying, like I think matcha or mate, if you do well with caffeine, get an organic coffee that's, you know, mold free. Or I suppose synthetic caffeine and hydrus. Yeah. Yeah. You could do that too. If you absolutely need that. And one of the things you and I didn't talk about is the notion that plants can be medicine. And they always have been. <laughs> but there's a difference between plants as medicine and plants as food. Right. And I don't want to distinguish our plant brothers. And, you know, like I I think that, and I, and I say that, you know, with some respect, like I, I think that plants are valuable lives on this planet. They're the reason we are here is because of them. For sure. And I think that they do have medicine for us. We've penicillin is from them. The psychedelics are super fascinating or in the realm. Even an anti, like a parasite cleanse using black walnut hull and wormwood and something. You don't want that every day, but if you have a parasite problem, you can yeah. use those plants as medicine, as a remedy exactly. to basically treat what you have going on. So it's not that I'm saying plants do not have value for humans. It's that using them as food is a totally different paradigm than using them as medicine. And I think you know, I'm super excited to see the studies that happen with psilocybin and many of these other plant compounds. Sure. I think it's going to help a lot of people with PTSD and et cetera. So I just wanted to make get that. I think there. it's beyond think. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a certainty, yeah. especially with the way the trials are going. Yeah. All right. So um, covered caffeine. What about if you want to get drunk? So I don't drink just personally. I understand A1. <laughs> I understand A1 <laughs> that you we, don't drink. We understand oh, well, you're boring yeah. as shit, Paul. <laughs> but like, if you got a drink, what's the best, what's the best way to get like drunk? A, like, a, like a pure grain alcohol. You know, like, like Everclear, like Everclear, like it's purified, the strongest or like, or alcohol, like a, or like a vodka, straight up alcohol, or like a vodka or something. I like heard that sake and tequila were the best as far as like not having the nitrates that you know you find in some of these sulfites, other alcohols, sulfites. Things, yeah. yeah, contrary to popular belief, I think wine causes a lot of problems for people. There's mold, mm -hmm. there's sulfites, beer is you know mold and gluten, etc. So yeah, I think these pure, more pure alcohols, sake, tequila. Like the clear alcohols are probably the way to go and the yeah. alcohols are probably real clear. But yeah, and just realize that's anyone's decision. That's your quality of life. There's going to be consequences on the back end. We know that sure. alcohol is going to deplete your glutathione. It'll come back. You'll get on with your life. I'm a little OCPD and I just say like, you know what? I'm good. I don't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can make bad decisions totally so. All right. All right. We've covered the bad stuff now. Let's go to, uh, let's go to the final question, which is, all right, man, everybody, everybody's on board. Right. We all believe what you're saying. Um, 
everybody's eating meat mm -hmm. and there's a lot of talk of a lot of people saying that cows are destroying the planet all of these different things what is your argument to say actually we could do this in a better way a better way that's holistically healthy for the earth as a whole and the people in it yeah this is such an important question thank you for asking this and the last chapter of my book is about this and the ethics of eating meat and there's so much wrapped into this and i think this is this is just as important a conversation that we need to have. And there's just like everything else, there's so much misleading data here and it takes a lot to unpack. So I'll try and do it as succinctly as possible. With regard to the claims that cows are contributing as much greenhouse gas as transportation, those are false. And they are based on a 2006 or 2009 study from the FAO, which has been retracted called Livestock's Long Shadow. And these calculations are complicated, but what they basically were doing is looking at a life cycle analysis of a cow. How many carbon dioxide equivalents, because cows emit methane, right? So we have to turn methane into carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere. How many carbon dioxide equivalents does a cow produce living from birth to death in a slaughterhouse? And this means all of the farm uh, equipment that's used to move the cows around, all the cows, all the trucks that move the cows, all the roads that those trucks are built on, all the carbon dioxide for the, the trucks that are moving the cows. This is a life cycle analysis. Like in order to get a cow, they're using, they're looking at carbon dioxide in every part of that cow, not just what's coming out of the, the pooper or the mouth. Mostly it's cow burps, right? That's what we would might call, quote, tailpipe emissions. Mm -hmm. Now, they compared that to strict tailpipe emissions for transportation. So this type of research would never get past a review board in medicine because they're saying, wait a minute, you're comparing apples to oranges. You're not even comparing how much methane comes out of a cow to how much carbon dioxide comes out of a tailpipe of a car. You're saying this much carbon dioxide comes out of tailpipes of all transportation. And this is how much carbon dioxide equivalents are produced by cows for their whole life cycle. So everything beyond what they burp. And when you do that math, it starts to look kind of bad for cows. When you adjust and you look tailpipe to tailpipe and you look how much methane does a cow burp out versus how much carbon dioxide is produced by a, or by a cow, by, by a car, excuse me, or by transportation, this is EPA data. So I didn't make this up. This is Environmental Protection Agency data that's freely available. Ruminants in the United States produce 1.9% of greenhouse gases per year. What is a ruminant? Uh, cow, bison, okay. sheep, deer. 1.9. Transportation, 26. Electricity generation, 27. Like coal burning, 30 plus percent. You're like, wait a minute, what? And it's crazy when you look at it. Like the numbers are bonkers. Like there's like to say that, like if you're comparing tailpipe to tailpipe, cows in the United States produce a, a fraction of the greenhouse gases of transportation. We really know who the culprits are here. And it's funny to see People like Elon with Tesla tweet about this and see some vindication. He said, like, a vegan diet won't solve climate change, right? Like, a vegan diet won't stop this. It's industry and burning of coal. If we believe that humans are contributing in a significant way to the carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere, and that is affecting our environment, which seems to be, is a very compelling thing to look at environmentally, then it's not coming from cows. And then if we go deeper down that rabbit hole, we realize that the methane from cows, methane is CH4 right? Let's take the carbon of the methane surrounded by four hydrogens and label it radioactively. And let's take the carbon in the carbon dioxide that comes out of a tailpipe of a car that burns gasoline and label that radioactively. Well, what's happening with methane from a cow? A cow burps methane, it goes into the atmosphere, and within 10 years, it's oxidized to become carbon dioxide. Now the same carbon from the burping cow is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It gets breathed in by a plant, which breathes carbon dioxide, right? And incorporated into carbohydrates. The carbon in carbohydrates of plants is from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that those plants respired, inspired, okay? Plants exhale oxygen, they inspire carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Cows eat that carbohydrate and then burp out the methane. And the exact same carbon atom has been circulating like this for thousands of years. Does that make sense? Yep. This is what's called the carbon cycle, the exact same carbon. So to say that that carbon was like created by a cow or destroyed by a cow, like, no, this exact same carbon atom is circulating in the environment and is part of a natural process that has been going on for thousands, millions of years. In 1850, there were 250 million ruminants in the United States. 
This is cows, buffalo, you know, elk, deer, antelope, pronghorn, okay? They've been here forever. They've been burping and pooping forever. And they created the most fertile grassland around by doing that, by making this land so fertile. Now let's look at that carbon from the, from the car. Where did that come from? That came from the ground. That was in an oil deposit in the ground. It was essentially like a vampire. It was asleep. It was in the bedrock of the earth in an oil deposit. It wasn't circulating. And it's new carbon that we are putting in the atmosphere. Okay? So when you burn fossil fuels in your car or you burn coal for electricity, and humans need to do this for today, we just need to realize that the emissions are different, right? Yeah. I'm not saying we should stop doing this. I think cleaner energy sources are important for humans. But that coal came from the ground. It was essentially asleep. Coal was taking a dirt nap. It wasn't circulating. And now you just took a piece of carbon in the coal and you put it in the atmosphere. That's new carbon. That's not carbon that's been cycling. That's a right. new carbon atom. Every time you drive your car, it's a new carbon atom. But people who argue against cows will say, oh, they're this, like cows are contributing to climate change. It's like, what are you talking about? Number one, the emissions data is skewed based on which data you look at. You really need to know whether you're looking tailpipe to tailpipe or life cycle to tailpipe, right? And if you're looking in the US or in the world, it's very confusing. If you really, like I said, look at the EPA data, cows are contributing a very small amount. And Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers have done a great job with this with their book, Sacred Cow, recently as well. And then if you look at the actual carbon molecules, they're circulating. It's not the same. It's a carbon cycle. You have new carbon coming from the ground, getting released in tailpipe emissions, and that's just going up to the atmosphere and becoming part of that. That's the same as what cows are burping? Nuh-uh. And nobody even talks about vegan farts because vegans are farting methane, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody's ever done that life cycle analysis. Sure. Like, how much do methane do vegans produce? And then you think about methane in general. You know what else produces methane? Like wetlands, <laughs> termites, the ocean floor, like these uh, shellfish on the ocean floor. Should we get rid of all those? Should we pave all the wetlands? You know what else provo you know, promotes, provides, or produces methane? Like landfills? Nobody ever talks about how, how much methane comes from our trash. Right. So methane is going into the environment and the minority of the methane in the environment is from cows. It's a significant contribution because of this is part of the life cycle, but termites I think actually produce more than cows and they're the biggest contributor. Should we eliminate termites? That might have some ecosystem ramifications. So problematic, right? And should we pave the ocean floor? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. This is part of a cycle. This is part of a cycle. And if you look at the methane amounts, there's a really interesting graph that I can send you from the FAO. So the same people that did this flawed study in 2006, 2009, have looked at methane emissions in the atmosphere and graphed it with regard to cows and it's leveling off, but the amount of cows keeps going up. So for people to say that methane is coming from cows, like that doesn't make sense. Like if cows are going up and cows are making all this methane, they should be going at the same level. But mm. methane is leveling off and cows just keep going up. The, the association there is broken down since 2009. So it's a very interesting thing. And you don't ever hear this level of nuance when somebody's from Beyond Burger is telling us that cows are killing the environment. Is there something, and I've heard this and I don't understand it too well, but there is this idea of carbon sequestering from, Absolutely. from cows that are actually able to roam and graze yes. versus the ones that are just stuck shoulder to shoulder in a factory farm? Yeah, so this is really cool. And I want to be very clear that I am not an advocate for factory farming. And we'll get, we, we'll get to this before we wrap up and I'll try and be succinct here. But I, I really believe we could do all agriculture with grass feeding and grass finishing. We could do all agriculture regenerative. We used to, and we just don't do it that way anymore. So, but what's fascinating, and I never knew this until I started digging into it. I think that more than any other metric that predicts the persistence of the human species, homo sapiens sapiens on the planet, soil carbon percentage may be very indicative more than anything else. Because the amount of soil, the amount of carbon in the soil will tell us how fertile that soil is. If you take, so like I hinted at, those. 250 million ruminants in the United States made some of the most carbon rich soil in the Midwest ever, which is why it was a, a, an absolute like boon for humans when they started growing crops on it. But the problem is that after generation after generation, after uh, with all these generations successively, when you do monocrop agriculture, when you grow plants and then you harvest the plants and you grow another plant and you harvest the plant and there's no animals on that land mm. to poop and pee and return nitrogen and carbon, that soil starts to get lower and lower and lower amounts of carbon. And there's a really cool farm in Georgia called White Oak Pastures. And the guys there, Will and Jenny Harris, have done so much research. They've been doing that 
They've been doing regenerative agriculture, which is grass feeding and grass finishing with rotational grazing. Just like buffalo herds would graze around, they would move, they move the cows around different paddocks. They have over 3,000 acres and they just move the cows every few days or every day they move. The cows eat the grass, they move. They eat the grass, they move. They eat the grass, they move. By the time they get back to this one, the grass has grown and it's super green and lush. This is how buffalo and grazing animals always do it. And if you look at the soil at White Oak Pastures over the last 20 years, there's a graph of this in my book. The soil carbon has gone from less than 1% to over 5%. It may not sound like a lot, but every 1% of carbon in the soil sequesters one inch of rain. Meaning that if you have a massive rain event, you can sequester now five inches of rain in the soil before there's runoff and erosion. And furthermore, every bit of carbon in the soil is coming from the atmosphere. So where did that soil come from? That soil carbon? It's coming from the atmosphere. So you are putting carbon back into the soil. When there's more carbon in the soil, it's also more fertile. Mm. So more plants grow. And you get this real difference between, if you look at a square foot of, of earth in Georgia at these farms, and you look at a square foot of earth in Texas that's been monocropped and now is being rehabilitated at farms like Rome Ranch. At Rome Ranch, they're just starting this process. There's only grass growing in like maybe 10% of that square foot of earth. So you can only gra graze so many cows there because that, that land is only growing 10% of the food. But in white oak pastures, it's like the full lawn that you had when you were a kid, right? And that's the difference is that when you have healthier soils, the soil microbiome is healthier. You get these mycorrhizal, these bacterial and fungal networks in the roots, which create healthier grass, which is more nutrient rich. There's more grass there and you can put more livestock on to eat the grass. And as the livestock are pooping and peeing there, the, the actual grass is pulling that carbon into the root networks. The healthier soil microbiome is sequestering that carbon into bacterial you know, colonies and you know, fungal networks around the roots. And you're basically pulling carbon from the atmosphere into the earth. Mm -hmm. General Mills did a life cycle analysis at White Oak Pastures. And they showed that, which is surprising because it's General Mills, right? Yep. They showed that the carbon footprint is negative. That for every pound of beef White Oak makes, they sequester like 3.5 pounds of carbon into the soil. Mm -hmm. Beyond Burger, soybeans, Impossible, they're all carbon positive, right? Now, to be fair, traditional farming of cattle, mono or, uh, you know, like uh, CAFOs, that is carbon positive and it's much more carbon positive, but regenerative agriculture is clearly carbon negative. So this is the incontrovertible argument. When cattle are raised on land, as they should be, as they have always been evolutionarily, you can sequester carbon into the land. It's not that car cows are contributing to climate change, it's that we have created a system which rewards consumers by giving them cheaper meat because of corn and soy subsidies for farmers. So we've just messed up the whole thing. We've said, here's your cheap meat, don't have, don't look, don't look behind the curtain. Don't look at what's going on in these, yeah. you know, feeding operations. Don't look at any of this stuff. Now, so that's that's the whole problem is that we're looking at it from so many different levels. And so then the final question, which I think is the most important one, is this: Can you scale regenerative agriculture? Correct. And you can. And this is what's so cool when you think about it. And um, when you look at the math, and first think about this: the majority of cows we eat, even if you go to Costco, which I'm not advocating for and buy grain, grain finished meat. The majority of that grain finished meat spent 85% of its life on pasture. And they brought it for the last 15% of its life to a feedlot to fatten it up. So most of the cattle that we're already eating was grass fed at one point. We have enough land to do this. But then if you're thinking, oh, we need more land. Well, there's a massive amount of acreage. Hundreds of thousands of acres in the United States are part of what's called the Conservation Reserve Program. The federal government pays farmers to let their land go fallow for decades. This is land that's been depleted of nutrients by monocrop farming. So the federal government pays farmers to just let their land sit so that it gradually gets an ecosystem back and gradually the soil recovers. Well, you could accelerate that process by putting animals on it. And that's exactly what we should be doing. Like you're leaving out a big part of the ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? What happens when you let land go fallow? Well, you just let it go wild and animals start to move back in. We could grow cattle on that land and make that soil get much more rich way faster. They're paying farmers to not farm their land. We could be raising cattle there and increasing the soil quality way faster. And then you look at all these places, you can do all the math, like, well, if we stop feeding cow cows corn, then we can stop growing all that corn, right? right? That's gonna hurt people's pockets who are receiving corn subsidies, so the government's gonna have to figure that out. And then we're not gonna be growing corn and that's gonna be problematic. Then we, what are we gonna do with all the ethanol or the soy or whatever we're feeding them? But then all the land that we're using to grow corn, we can grow cows on too, 
And it's just, and then when you make the soil healthier. How are you going to get a liter of cola for 45 cents <laughs> if you don't have all that high fructose corn syrup? Though? From the corn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right so that's that's going to be a dollar for your liter of cola that's the level at which you kind of do the face palm and you're like oh i get it yeah i get it like corn and soy subsidies reach deep into sort of the fabric of the american government and the fabric of lobbies and congress and lawmaking and to change that would be m massive and that may be the linchpin. I don't even know. You know, you got to think about all these different levels. Like, what do we need to pull? But when we're giving farmers tons of money to grow corn and soy and encouraging them to feed cows corn and soy and making it difficult, you know, to raise cattle properly, we're making it hard for Americans to be healthy. We talked about this earlier. When you can get a Big Mac for less than a plant, you're in trouble. I mean, you can definitely get a Big Mac for less than a real steak. And so there's some inequality here. Like we're telling people what to eat. And a lot of, you know, like people need to feed their families and they're going to just try and get calories. This is what humans have always done. And so our resources are just in a strange place right now. Imagine if we took corn and soy subsidies and gave that to farmers doing regenerative agriculture, which is going to be an environmental boon anyway. That could be the environmental stimulus package. We're going to take all this corn and soy subsidy, give it to regenerative agriculture farmers, bring down the price of regeneratively raised meat, and make it more affordable. If we could get grass-fed, grass-finished ground beef for $3 a pound or $4 a pound widely, that could be a huge game changer. Well, Put shit. some liver in there too. It would change the world. <clears throat> and if we're talking about subsidies, I mean, that's the way place the government could step in. I mean, you look at the cost of healthcare in our nation. Crazy. We're looking at the comorbidity associated with COVID deaths. We're looking at all these things yeah. and we're throwing trillions of dollars just to shut everything down well if we took a fraction of that money fine spend all that money all good whatever we do what we're going to do but nonetheless like we have the ability to create these resources if we started creating these holistic interventions like the just the whole nation would be radically different and from you know a carbon footprint level to the human health level to the money we're spending on health care to the you know different psychological downstream effects of better nutrition and less inflammation i mean this whole thing could start to change in an incredibly dramatic way it's all wrapped up together and in order to do that people need to realize starts with knowledge the truth red meat ain't bad for you and cattle farmers aren't rich <laughs> like yeah you don't see cattle farmers driving lamborghinis you know like who's driving lamborghinis freaking the guys behind beyond burger and impossible burger like processed food makes people fat cats. And I'm not saying making money's wrong. I'm just saying that like people want to say like, oh, meat is overpriced. Yeah. But like meat is not a lucrative business. These people do this because they love ranching and they love raising animals and they love this type of work, but they're not, they're not rich. You know, they're not. Well, maybe the CEO of Tyson or something. Like exactly. That. Like an agribusness company that makes right. chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But like the farmers I know are just good salt of the earth people. They're not, they don't want to well, Especially the ranches that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. They're amazing. All right. Well, you've saved human health and the world here, Paul. So <laughs> Wait, I think, done, I think, I think done your, day's day, your day's done. Should we go get a second workout? Yeah, just shit in a shit in a jar for me, and I'll let you. I'll let you <laughs> out of here. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks so much, man. So uh, two things: Carnivore Code. It's your book. I'm sure available everywhere. Available everywhere. The Carnivore Code Book dot com. Officially released August the fourth. Check it out, you guys. I wrote it for anyone who's suffering or anyone who wants more information. There. It's it's my. It's my passion. It's my baby. Mm -hmm. And then this uh, bone marrow and liver supplement that From you have Heart here. and soil. Yep. Yeah. Heartandsoilsupplements.com. We've got beef organs, bone marrow, and liver. We want to make it easier for people to get organs if they don't, if they're not down with like eating liver. Yeah. Not the most delicious, but you know, it's an acquired taste. It's an acquired taste. And then we have you know, some actually really good blends that are like mostly grass fed meat. And then they sprinkle in a little kidney, yeah. a little heart, a little liver. Yeah. That's a nice way to do it. There's a lot of places like Force of Nature doing that that'll mm -hmm. give you these like ancestral blends. And you can get Force of Nature at Whole Foods. That's amazing, right? That's yeah. the beginning of the start. Yeah. So, but yeah, these are awesome. What I want people to do first and foremost is to eat the organ meats real, <laughs> eat the fresh organ meats. If you can't eat, do that. We've got supplements for you to help you out there, but just think about the things we outlined, you know? Don't be afraid of red meat. Understand that plants are toxic. They exist on a toxicity spectrum. Get rid of vegetable oils and go from there. And you guys will, <clears throat> I want to hear about it. You know, reach out to me on social media and let me know how you're doing. And yeah, super exciting stuff, man.
Thank you so much, brother. It's a pleasure I to be here. I appreciate this. It was fucking one of the most <clears throat> informative and valuable podcasts I've ever done. So. It's, it's, my, it's an honor, brother. It's yeah, an honor. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. Peace. Thanks for checking out this video. For more like it, please subscribe to my channel. And of course, the Aubrey Marcus podcast with new episodes every single week. And follow me on Instagram at Aubrey Marcus. Thank you so much.